Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this um, virtual meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Commission. I'm Councillor Peter Southgate, and I will be chairing this evening. I'd like to introduce you to uh, members of the Commission. Um, and for your information, we had 83 visitors to our, our last meeting, so uh, we can't expect everyone to know our names. Um, Councillor Peter McCabe, uh, is my vice chair and also chair of the Healthier Communities and Older People's Panel. Councillor Brenda Fraser, Brenda, if you could indicate, uh, is chair of the Children and Young Persons Panel. And Councillor Aidan Mundy uh, chairs the Sustainable Communities Panel. Uh, in addition, other members, uh, Councillor Paul Kohler, uh, Councillor Nick McLean, Councillor Billy Christie, um, Councillor Ben Butler, Councillor Ed Gretton. Hi, Peter. Hi, thank you. Um, and Councillor Geraldine Stanford joining us via the, the phone. In addition, uh, we welcome Ros Cordner, our uh, Representative of the Church of England Diocese, nice to see you again, Roz, and Mansour Ahmed, our uh, parent governor representative for secondary and special schools. Hi. So, uh, do I have any apologies for absence? There are no apologies, Chair. No apologies, thank you. And any declarations of pecuniary interest? None showing. Uh, can we look at the minutes for our last meeting? Um, and can I ask for assent that those be uh, treated as a, an accurate record? I'm happy with that, thank you. Um, and I don't see matters arising, so we will carry on. And we three substantial items on the agenda this evening, but the, the first one is a presentation from our Chief Executive Jake Curran on um, how Merton has been reacting to the pandemic, a very, very much a moving feast. He was going to be talking to us a month ago and possibly it's a quite a different talk now, Jed, but uh, either way, we, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. We'll then uh, take questions from members afterwards. Jed, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and first of all, can I extend my apologies that I wasn't able to join you uh, last time. There was a, a freak power cut in my street that meant I wasn't able to join the meeting, so I am sorry about that. Uh, nobody in CMT actually believed the power cut was real, uh, but it was, so, uh, so I'm sorry that uh, that happened. Um, I hope by the time I've run through the, the update, um, you will feel that councillors the council, our partners and our community have responded very well to the challenges that COVID has presented. Uh, and it is in a way easy for us to get caught up in some kind of self-congratulatory uh, sense of feeling about what's been happening. Uh, I wanted to start off by acknowledging and reminding us all that uh, during the last year through COVID, over 400 of our residents have died uh, because of COVID. Uh, and every one of those deaths is a tragedy for their friends and family and everybody who knew them. We also know that the cumulative effect of the lockdowns and the constraints on people's lives have become harder and harder for people to bear and the strain that people are working under uh, is very, very difficult indeed. And I know everybody in the council is conscious of that. When we run uh, staff surveys, it's very clear that our staff are feeling the difficulties and we know that everybody in the community is too. So it's incredibly important that we sustain our efforts in trying to help everybody cope with COVID. The good news is that the uh, rate of spread of the virus is coming down quite significantly. The peak uh, for the virus was in the first week of January, where we were nearly at uh, a thousand cases per 100,000 uh, tests in the borough. We are now down to just over 150 per 100,000. So that's a very significant uh, decline. However, it is worth remembering that when COVID first uh, became uh, prevalent in the country, 
we were talking about a case rate of 20 per 100,000 as a significant indicator requiring firm action. So whilst the decline has been great since January, being at 150 per 100,000 is still a significant concern. And it's very important that we communicate to everybody the need to continue with the simple measures which are gonna make everybody safe. And that's about washing our hands, wearing masks when we're in a public space and maintaining social distance wherever we can. And if we can stick to that, we will continue the decline that's taking place. The testing regime is a key part of uh, managing uh, the virus. Most people on this call will know that there's a distinction between the tests that take place when you have symptoms and the tests that take place when you have no symptoms, uh, but it's important that you find out uh, whether you are carrying uh, the virus, but you may not have symptoms, you may be asymptomatic. The, the, the tests for people with symptoms are the PCR tests, which are run by the national system, but the council helps run the asymptomatic testing, the LFT tests. We run those through Morden Assembly Hall uh, and we work with local pharmacists as well who also provide those tests. Uh, we've had very good take up when we first launched uh, that service. Uh, in recent weeks, uh, the take up has tended to decline. I think that's linked to three things. Uh, we, the weather has been quite poor, so it's been hard for people to get out anyway. Um, the rate of the virus has declined quite significantly, so the level of anxiety has declined. Uh, and the tests themselves are quite invasive, uh, and not many people continue a regime of, of testing on a regular basis. So those are all uh, common features uh, across the country in relation to the LFT testing. We've also had a very specific uh, period of testing in Pollard's Hill in the last fortnight. That was as part of a national programme to try and identify the best way of tackling new variants of the virus, which in, in the terminology they're referring to as vox or variants of concern. We have just completed the two week pilot test in Pollard's Hill. We were asked to distribute 10,000 test kits in that period, and we have successfully distributed the 10,000 test kits. In the first week, we had a return rate of just over 40%. I haven't seen the figures for the second week's a return rate. We've yet to have any of those cases or any of those tests reported back to us as revealing uh, a variant of concern. Uh, the particular uh, issue they were looking for was the South African variant, uh, but they do say that the lab tests take up to a fortnight to run. So uh, it could be a couple of weeks before we get the details in relation to that. Uh, engaging the community, uh, managing uh, the messages about what was going on, and trying to encourage people to participate was a very significant exercise. We had less than 24 hours notice that we were asked to carry this out. Uh, and I think everybody came together uh, in a very coordinated and effective way uh, to carry out that, that exercise. It did have a significant impact on the community in Pollard's Hill. Uh, there was a lot of misunderstanding about what was going on and it did lead to one school closing for a period of time. Uh, several people reported to us uh, that they struggle to have deliveries uh, to, to their residences in Pollard's Hill area. And many people were told by their employers not to go into work, uh, all of which stemmed from a misunderstanding of the process, but did have a, 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 a negative impact. Uh, we fed back all of our experiences into the people who were assessing the pilots. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, I'm pretty clear that they've accepted that uh, there were errors in the way uh, that this was launched and that they won't be carrying on some of the things that cause problems for us in future. So uh, whilst it's been no comfort to people in Pollard's Hill for the last fortnight, uh, the pilot will help in shape better responses in future. We also have a significant vaccination programme taking place, which people would be aware of. Uh, there are three venues currently where that can happen. It can happen in the hospitals. It can happen through the GP primary care networks, which for Merton are based in Wilson uh, and the Nelson site. Uh, and there are mass sites currently working in South West London, in Kingston at Hawks Road uh, and at Crystal Palace with a plan to expand those shortly. We have limited data yet from our health colleagues about the vaccination program and how it's progressing. Uh, we do have headline figures for the first three tiers uh, of people invited to be vaccinated. So the, the latest data we have is that of the uh, 80 year olds uh, plus, they've 
they feel that they vaccinated 78% of those. Of the age group up to 75, they feel that 79% of those uh, have been vaccinated. And the 70 to 75 age group, 81% of that grouping had been vaccinated. Within our care homes, 92.5% of all residents have been vaccinated. Uh, so that's been a, a particularly successful route. They are starting to move further down the nine categories uh, as they roll out the vaccination programme. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to continue to return to uh, the other categories and to try and make sure that they cover everybody uh, in those different groups. So, so that will continue. The hope for the health, our health colleagues is that they can provide us with much more granular data in the very near future. And as soon as that's available, we'll make it available to members as well. A particular challenge during the peak period, uh, especially through January, was that the hospitals were under enormous pressure. And there was a concern that we might not be able to sustain the normal discharge arrangements, where normally we help the hospitals when they have um, frail and elderly people who need to move out from the hospital and be accommodated. I'm pleased to say that although it was put under enormous strain, the discharge arrangements held up uh, and they worked very successfully and we did manage to safely provide accommodation for everybody we were asked to do so uh, by our local hospitals. Uh, the pressure is now declining uh, on the local hospitals and therefore the pressure on us has declined too. I said in opening that a lot of the things the council have done have relied on the support and help of many other people and that is particularly true in relation to the support that's been given to the community uh, when we've been looking at those who are shielding. Uh, we've managed to develop a very strong community hub uh, run through MVSC and our partners in the uh, third sector, which has provided enormous support and help to residents. We have a cohort of six and a half thousand people in the borough whom we've been shielding since the shielding regime started um, in May of last year. Uh, yesterday, we were notified of a further four and a half thousand people who we've been asked to bring on to the, uh, the shielding rotor. And we will be working with our colleagues in the community hub to provide support to them. Uh, the support that we provide is to ensure that people have their essential needs met, which is uh, at the most basic level to ensure that they have access to food. Um, after the first wave, uh, the arrangements with the supermarkets have worked pretty effectively uh, together with the um, food banks that operate in the borough. So we're fairly confident that, in fact, no, not fairly, we are absolutely confident that we can meet all of the food needs uh, of residents. In the recent past, the support that people have looked for has been much more along the practical help that they may need, whether it's for walking dogs, or, or sometimes people just want somebody to talk to uh, when they feel they haven't been able to get out of the house. So we've been able to provide all of that support, uh, and I'm sure that we'll be able to do so for the additional 4,500 people who've come onto the list. The new additions to the list have been made following a study through Oxford University, which identified a series of additional factors which may make a person particularly vulnerable to the virus or particularly vulnerable to developing uh, very severe symptoms. Uh, and they've then been through the GP list to identify people with those additional characteristics. Uh, the numbers vary very significantly uh, across uh, London, depending on the, uh, the communities that the different boroughs serve. So we have four and a half thousand. I know that Tower Hamlets have had an additional 13,000 people notified to them overnight. So uh, there's going to be a very significant challenge in different parts uh, of London. Our communications have been uh, very effective as well. Uh, and not only we relied on the normal uh, methods of communicating people, but we've developed a series of community champions. We have 125 people who are signed up as community champions who engage in uh, discussing with, uh, with the public and working with their, co with their uh, their colleagues and people who they're connected with to try and encourage compliance with uh, all of the um, restrictions that apply in relation to COVID and also to explain what is happening and provide support to people. And there's a very specific youth engagement network as well that's linked to that. The clear indication from the government in relation to schools is that they plan for them to be fully reopened on March the 8th. 
and there will probably be an enhanced testing regime as well developed alongside that, though we've yet to receive full details of that. It's quite important to note and recognise that the schools haven't actually been shut at any point in time. They've always been open for the children of key workers uh, and those who've needed uh, education for their, their children in a school setting. It's been noticeable in this latest lockdown that that facility has been taken up much more by the community than it was in the past. So we've seen a 30% increase across our schools in the numbers of children uh, who are coming to school at the moment. COVID has had an impact not on people, only on people's health, but also on the economy. And we have distributed over 30 million pounds worth of business grants uh, during the period. Uh, it hasn't always been easy to process the grants. We've had uh, 12 separate regimes. I think it might now be up to 14. I know Caroline's on the call and she can probably uh, advise later on. Um, so all of them come with their, their own sets of conditions and rules for, uh, for how people apply and their own reporting regime back to central government. And some of them were only available for a very short period of time. Uh, things move on very quickly, but I suspect most people will remember that uh, we had different tiers with different conditions attached to them. And depending which tier you are on, uh, may opened up the opportunity for businesses to apply for grants. So at one point we had a situation where a business grant was available, but only for three days when London moved from one tier to another. So it's been quite complex to manage all of that and make sure that process works. We have managed to distribute, as I say, over 30 million pounds. It's also had a significant impact on individuals. Before COVID uh, struck, Merton had just over 4% of its uh, population that was claiming universal credit. Uh, we are now just at 10% of the population who are signed up for universal credit. So the economic impact is real uh, on individual people. We've also had to try and think about how we uh, help people who are homeless and also help uh, people who are sleeping rough. Merton is fortunate in that we do not have large numbers uh, in these categories compared with many other parts of London. Uh, but we, uh, we have been able to offer accommodation to all of our rough sleepers. Uh, and we've also have a very effective homelessness service to, to help uh, residents generally. We have had two individuals who have steadfastly resisted all of the offers of assistance and support that we made available to them or not stayed in the uh, accommodation that, that we have made available to them. So we are continuing to try and work with them to encourage them to, to use the, the resources that are there. But I suspect that will be a, a continuing effort. The council as an institution is not immune uh, from the financial impacts as well. Uh, it would be entirely churlish not to acknowledge that the government has attempted to provide support to local authorities uh, throughout this period. And the council has, um, through various sets of support arrangements, uh, been offered £22 million, which is a significant sum, uh, to assist with all of the uh, costs incurred by the authority and the losses that the authority have incurred as, uh, as a result of COVID. However, the, the overall costs and losses to the uh, authority have been calculated to around £29 million. So there's a net deficit of £7 million, which uh, we're going to have to find ways of managing ourselves uh, and we are going to move into a new financial year, of course, uh, with COVID still uh, as an issue in the borough. So we'll need to continue discussions with the government about how that is supported. So I'd, I'd like to finish there. I, I'm happy to take questions uh, and I hope I'll be able to answer them. Anything I don't know the, the answers to, I'll obviously uh, respond uh, later to you with. Um, I also have a set of slides that provide a lot more information. I was very conscious of the time and the other items you've got on the agenda. So I'll circulate the slides separately uh, for you. Uh, and if you want to contact me about those separately, I'd be very happy to respond to that. We have seen the best of Merton in these challenging times. Councillors have carried out a fantastic job in engaging with the community and helping support officers in the jobs they have to do. Our officers have worked diligently and effectively, I think, in trying to respond to the challenges that we face and our partners in the public sector and especially the, the third section of the community sector have, have all worked incredibly well over this very challenging year. So I've been very proud to be associated with it uh, and I hope we continue the level of support and success that we've demonstrated so far. 
Uh, and then the final thing I would say is, I know we all get tired of hearing it, but it's really important that we keep repeating it. We all need to keep that process going of remembering to frequently wash our hands, to wear our masks and to maintain social distance. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm happy to try and respond to any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, for that comprehensive overview. Let, let's um, take questions there. Perhaps we'll, we'll take them two at a time. I can see Councillor Mundy indicating and Councillor McCabe, Aidan first. Thanks, uh, Chair, and thanks very much, Jed. It was really, really good to hear the update and all the fantastic work officers and community and everyone's been doing, especially with my experience in the NHS seeing from that end as well, it's been a real partnership. Um, I've just got a question on, um, you, you mentioned that there was decline in participation in LFT testing or the early warning testing. I was wondering what alternative models of distribution and participation um, are being considered? And Peter, let, let's have your, your question too. Chair, I've got two quick questions, if that's permitted. Okay. Uh, the first one, well, firstly, can I thank the Chief Executive for his uh, report and for bringing us up today? And I'd like to pass on um, our thanks to um, the staff for their uh, sterling efforts on behalf of the community. Um, my first question is, uh, you mentioned that we had um, incurred a uh, total expenditure on COVID of 29 million uh, and had recovered 22. I understand that at the beginning of this crisis, the government uh, said, um, spend whatever it takes. So my question is, what prospect uh, is there of recovering that uh, additional seven million pounds so it doesn't fall on the um, council taxpayers of Merton? And the um, second question uh, is about the issue of the problem around Pollard's Hill, because the announcement that was made uh, on the first evening was that the um, postal area CR4 uh, was affected. And this was on um, national news uh, and broadcast at regular intervals. Uh, it turned out that it was a proportion of CR4. Who was responsible? for raising the level of anxiety uh, amongst the residents of CR4 who were not in the Pollard's Hill area. Okay, thank you, Peter. Jed, uh, from the question on the uh, lateral flow tests and alternative models for delivering those, and from Peter, two rather different questions, really, on the, uh, in the words of Mario Draghi, the, the, the whatever it takes promise, and the um, miss, um, uh, the targeting of SM4 in the first instance as to where the... CR4. CR4, CR4. Thank you, Peter. Of, uh, where the outbreak had occurred. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Councillor Mundy, uh, for your question. So uh, I know quite a lot of effort is going into thinking about different distribution models. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw the Times today, uh, but the Times was reporting that a, a model is being suggested of direct posting to people's homes. Um, uh, together with distribution hubs being used where people can actually collect uh, the LFT tests and use them at home. Uh, I should probably have said in the presentation, so thank you for, for raising the question, Councillor Mundy, that when we set up all our arrangements, the lateral flow tests were not licensed for use in people's homes. Uh, they could only be used in a supervised setting. Uh, and that, uh, that only changed over the Christmas period uh, where they have now been licensed for home use. Uh, and so what that's done is open up all of those different possibilities. Uh, I would anticipate that when we start to see the, the plans for schools returning in early March, there'll probably be a link there to uh, much more home-based testing uh, with the LFT kits. Uh, a number of other authorities have also been considering citing um, uh, mobile units where LFT tests could be used and trying to cite those mobile units where we have the areas of highest footfall, uh, which for most places in these days tend to be in large uh, open spaces or in large parks uh, where people are uh, gathering in, uh, in large numbers, sometimes socially distanced, sometimes not. So people have been looking at perhaps using that uh, as a, a means of 
credit using them. But uh, all of that is an ongoing conversation uh, with the government as we try and work through the possibilities, particularly what home testing allows for LFTs. Yeah. Turning to Councillor McCabe's question, thank you, first of all, for the, those kind words. And I will certainly make sure they're passed on to, to staff that the recognition you're giving for their, their efforts. Um, it, it is correct to say that the Secretary of State did say in the very first conference call that uh, happened uh, that we should do whatever was necessary and that we all of the costs would be met. And that hasn't turned out to be uh, the case in the end. Um, I frankly am doubtful that all of the monies that we've uh, requested uh, will be met in the financial year because I think we'd have been notified of it by now if that was to happen. Uh, clearly, this is an issue which only affects Merton. The Local Government Association has been negotiating on behalf of all of the local authorities uh, and so has London councils on behalf of uh, the London authorities. Uh, it is possible that we may get some additional monies probably tied to very specific activities, uh, but I don't think uh, I could, uh, in all honesty, hold out to you real hope uh, that the seven million uh, would be met now. Um, so I'm afraid that's that's where we, we are in relation to that. Um, on, on Pollard's Hill, um, the, uh, the decision to, well, so the, the first communications uh, about Pollard's Hill were part of national communications uh, and the national communications uh, created an impression that in all of the, the test areas, uh, the variant of concern was a, a more dangerous version of the virus than it actually was uh, and didn't actually represent that this was a pilot data gathering exercise uh, rather than a public health issue. So it was unfortunate that the national uh, information um, uh, wasn't as clear as perhaps it could have been. So that, that had partly an impact and that was picked up by the main uh, national news media. Uh, also, the, uh, the decision to pick CR4 as a postcode was made by Public Health England as part of the national uh, re regime as well as the other areas that they picked. Uh, the council bears some responsibility as well. Uh, I shouldn't shirk that. When we first put the information on our website, for the first, I think, six hours, we referenced the CR4 site uh, area as well. Uh, and it was only after that six hours that we uh, took that down and put it up as the Pollard's Hill area with a map that clearly defined it. But that's, that, that's how we ended up there. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I have Mansoor, uh, Billy and Ed. Shall we take those three together? And um, Mansoor first. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chief Executive. Uh, thank you for the beautiful report. Martin's role is greatly appreciated. I've got a question here. Uh, what is the total number of people in Martin who have received the first and second co dose of COVID-19 vaccine? And in terms of Martin's total population, what is the percentage? Thank you. Thank you. And Billy? Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to the Chief Executive for his update. Um, going back to the topic of the um, spend whatever it takes to tackle the pandemic uh, issue, uh, the Chief Executive mentioned that there was a uh, seven million pound imbalance in terms of what uh, the, the pandemic has cost the Council and what we have reimbursed for. Could could I just ask the Chief Executive to expand on the kind of things that we as a council have had to spend and pay out for that we have not been reimbursed for? So what is it that, it, that we've been having to spend that the government are not reimbursing us for and uh, fulfilling their promise on? Thank you. And uh, Ed, please, your question. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite concerned actually to hear, in, in fairness, the statements of Jed. I mean, as the officer, we respect what he said, and it's, it's excellent to hear what he says uh, on, on COVID and, and the health and upper and all this type of thing. But he's actually drifting into very political territory because if you look to the own numbers of the council, you'll see that the direct expenditure of Merton Council for the full financial year is stated at eight million pounds, i.e., we haven't spent that yet, and yet the council has received in excess of fifteen million pounds 
put on ring fence spending and money to be put in reserves and things like that. So for the chief executive to be saying berating the government, I'm afraid, is, is entirely inappropriate, Peter, and uh, it is drifting into very political territory. And to, particularly to say you, you're missing 7 million because you know that Robert Jenrick 70p in the pound funding, which was 3.6 million pounds for the second part of the year, that money for the third part of the year, which is December, January, February, March, has not been included in the numbers you've got in front of you, Chief Executive. You've also included in your cost of COVID all the savings which you said you were going to take this year, which you didn't deliver on, which you chose as a matter of policy not to, not to complete. So that's your counting in that seven million, the cost of savings. You're missing out Robert Jenrick's final tranche of money, and you're also missing out the four million pounds or whatever it is, which Caroline Holland, your finance director, said last night could be as high as five million pounds, which we're going to see in the first quarter of the new financial year. Again, those numbers are not in your own budget papers, Chief Executive. So I think you're drifting into very political territory. And I, I kind of I might expect that from Councillor Allison, um, Chief Executive, who's the leader of the council, who didn't even know if the last financial year of the council was a surplus or a deficit. So I'm afraid those, those statements you've made about Robert Jenrick's funding seem to be entirely unsafe, Chief, Chief Executive. Uh, Ed, let me say that whilst it's fair game for members of the administration to respond on um, political points, it's not at all fair or appropriate to accuse one of our, our most senior officer of... Well, the number... I'm sorry. The, Ed, the I'm sorry. No, I'm, so uh, it's my right to... No, I'm, um, I, I personally judge the Chief Executive's response on that to be uh, careful and, and accurate. So we're not going to stray into political argument, at least of all, are we going to drag officers into that? Um, started. Let's take um, Mansour's point first about the number of people who've been vaccinated um, and what that represents as a percentage. And then we have Billy's point about um, what sort of expenditure have we been laying out that uh, has, has not uh, been recovered. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, and thank you, Mr. Ahmed, for your, for your question. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to give you the answer uh, that, that I would like to. Uh, th this data is held by our, our health colleagues, uh, and I've yet to receive... That, that kind of uh, level of detail uh, in relation to, to what's happening uh, in Merton. So all I have is the figures that I, I read out slightly earlier on in relation to the age groups. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think Henry's actually started on this second, uh, the, the second wave uh, of, of injections. I, I don't think the 12 weeks is up for any of the first grouping. I mean, there may be a very small number uh, who were in the very earliest wave. Um, uh, Councillor Monday may have more information on that th than I do. Um, uh, so as soon as the data is made available to my health colleagues, I'll, I'll certainly circulate that and uh, it'll be on the council's website uh, as well. Um, uh, going, turning to Councillor Christie's um, question. Uh, so the, uh, the resources that come to uh, the council um, go to meet the expenditure that we've had to incur specifically in relation to trying to respond to COVID. So they will go to the costs of things like um, uh, when there was all the difficulties with PPE, we became a supplier of PPE to all the care homes and to, uh, to uh, in fact, we gave support to some health colleagues and everybody else along those kind of lines. Um, we've had to incur additional costs in terms of the care and support we give through our community contracts. Uh, we've been uh, involved in financial costs of providing food in the earlier stages uh, when shielding started before the food arrangements were set up uh, with the, uh, the supermarkets. Uh, and we've had to uh, engage in significant additional costs in terms of enforcement and communication, um, as well as a very significant additional care packages that, that have been involved. Uh, the, by and large, the monies that we receive from the government have matched the areas where we've had to spend money on specific COVID activities. Uh, where the area of dispute arises, uh, and this will come up when I try and respond to Councillor Gretton as well, is where we start to identify the losses that the council has incurred, uh, because that then takes you into the territory of income foregone uh, and the ability to implement some of the changes which we would say would otherwise have happened 
but for the fact that we were having to cope with COVID. There is never to be, inevitably an opportunity cost. If you start doing A, then the resources that you wanted to spend on B can't be spent on B because they'd be expense on A. Um, now, th there is a scope there for people to dispute uh, A, what should be in scope and what shouldn't be in scope, and secondly, to what extent and what value should be allocated to that. Uh, I do think you've got the budget on the agenda later on, so that, that may become part of a, a richer conversation. And certainly Caroline is much closer to the detail on that, so, so she should be able to give you further information. But it's when it comes to the recompense for the income foregone uh, and the same that that's where the real gap has opened up between what we receive. To the best of my knowledge, the vast majority of local authorities are in a very similar position uh, to us, uh, except that the losses that they're identifying are even larger uh, than the ones that, that we're identifying. Um, turning to Councillor uh, Gretton's point, um, uh, this is a serious matter uh, and it's entirely reasonable that people should feel passionately about it. So uh, I, I don't feel personally got at uh, by what Councillor Gretton was saying, uh, and I appreciate the, uh, the passion and concern that, that he's expressing and what he's trying to uh, communicate to us. Uh, I did try, I hope I tried, uh, to acknowledge that the government has been uh, trying to assist local authorities and we have had a significant sum of money uh, transferred to, towards us and I, I hope that that's a fair acknowledgement of it. Um, the information we have from our own professional accountants is that despite all of that there is the gap of seven million pounds and I am reporting to you faithfully what our own professional accountants are saying. I, I'm not trying to, I'm not leaping therefore to any conclusion that says anybody is particularly bad or particularly bad and or particularly good I'm just presenting you with the facts that others will have to form their, their own opinion about that subsequently um, so that's, that's all I can really say about that uh, thank you chair thank you chair um, let me come next to uh, Councillor Kohler and then Councillor McLean and Peter I'll come back to you um, you know once I'm satisfied that every member of the commission has had a chance to have one a first question Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Jed, for your report, and thank you to the officers for all their work. Um, I'm sorry this is politicised. We shouldn't be politicising scrutiny. We've told Councillor Gretton this before. Um, just a moment of clarification, actually, and maybe Caroline can, can, can answer this rather than Jed. Last night, the figure we talked about was 9.3 million shortfall. Um, now we're talking about 7 million shortfall. Uh, have, I, have I missed something there? Or... Caroline, maybe you could, you could help yeah. us on that. So I think, um, depending on if Jid was going to do his speech last month, then that would have been the December monitoring. We've subsequently had the January monitoring where the position has got worth because of the national lockdown. So it's gone from 7.5 to 9.3, the, the deficit purely related to COVID. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yes, Nick, please. Hello, Jed. Uh, look, thanks for, along, uh, for coming tonight. Um, first of all, I'd just like to echo your condolences when you uh, began your report with regards to those that have sadly lost their life, lives in Merton. Um, and as leader of the opposition, I also want to thank you for your weekly updates and keeping uh, me and the Conservative group abreast um, right along uh, throughout this uh, very, very difficult time. Um, with regard to the, 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 some of the statements being made by opposition parties today, I also thank you for making the correct quote that the Secretary Strait actually said, which was whatever it is necessary, not whatever it takes. And thank you for that accuracy. And also for clarifying that when that speech was made, it was actually relating to spend. And of course, though the pandemic's gone on a lot longer and that has had a huge impact on the income. And of course, you've got to have both sides of the, of the ledger. And of course, the 75p in the pound is an additional and was not included in that speech. So um, I just want to clarify that point, but my really one I want to say is thank you very much for you and the officers' work during uh, this very difficult period. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that, Nick. Actually, it's quite a, a judicious uh, statement, helpful. Councillor Frey, is that? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Jed, for your update. I actually sat on one in the, in the middle of the week already, but here we are again. Um, I want to ask a question which is really bothering me. There are some people who uh, have no recourse to public funds, yet the media is saying that those are the people who, when they're not very ill, they've been di diagnosed with COVID, and so they should be isolated. 
but because they're not showing symptoms that's keeping them in bed, they've gone to work. Hence, they could be spreading the virus even more. So if is there any recourse to public funds or they just have to get on with it? Thank you. Would you like me just to respond to that, Chair? Well, actually, let me just ask uh, Councillor Stanford. Okay. Can, um, I thought was indicating she wanted to ask a question. Geraldine? Um, uh, well, well not, uh, not, nothing really to add uh, to what's been said already, apart from uh, uh, my uh, thanks to Jed and, and all the staff and the voluntary sector and, uh, and, and, and councillors. Uh, who've been helping uh, throughout this uh, uh, this terrible, terribly difficult time. Um, uh, um, uh, I was um, uh, a bit uh, concerned about the the issue of um, the um, uh, anti-vaccine um, uh, uh, lo not lobby. I wouldn't call it a lobby, but the certain members of the community who, who are. Uh, you know, uh, for, for whatever reason, do not want to, to accept the vaccine. And I know uh, that the National Health and, uh, and other bodies are um, trying to find out what it is that's um, um, uh, uh, preventing them from uh, wanting to take the vaccine. Uh, and is there any, uh, is there any kind of up, update on that? Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. Two pertinent questions about people who were put into a difficult position by um, uh, exposed to COVID. Um. Yes, so um, it is correct that there is confusion about people who have no recourse to public funds. And in fact, it's now recognised that there's a significant problem for, for lots of members of the community uh, when they're asked or should self-isolate. We do have a self-isolation payment that's available, but the conditions attached to it are uh, probably far too severe. So many people don't qualify uh, for those payments. Uh, the other difficulty that we have is that uh, sick pay uh, in the UK is comparatively low compared with international comparators. So there are many financial barriers to people to self-isolate. People who are living in houses in multiple occupation uh, often have nowhere that they actually can uh, self-isolate. Uh, and uh, we have multi-generational households as well as a very specific problem. Uh, this was acknowledged by SAGE in September, uh, where they identified uh, a need to revisit uh, the, the financial picture to improve communication so people better understood what was available to them and also suggested that we should be making alternative accommodation available for people uh, where that, that would assist people uh, in self-isolating. Uh, the government has been looking at this. It, it, it's a major uh, exercise to overhaul the council, the, council, the um, country's sick pay uh, regimes. So it, it's understandable in a way it's taken some time. But my understanding is that there is going to be announcements in the next couple of weeks about changes to the self-isolation arrangements. In addition, one of the things that's emerged from the pilot that was happening in Pollard's Hill uh, and Ealing and Haringey is that that's also highlighted the difficulties of self-isolation. So they are exploring at the moment whether they'll run a pilot of, of increased uh, payments and other arrangements for self-isolation within London uh, just to test out those propositions. And again, we should see uh, their decisions about that in the next fortnight. Uh, so, so we'll have to see what happens. But it, it is a real challenge. It, um, it's easy to sit, fall into kind of sloppy thinking and just think, well, people just don't want to comply. Uh, but actually, there are really strong rational reasons why many people don't comply with the self-isolation when, uh, when they really should. Um, uh, and then turning to Councillor Stanford and the anti-vax uh, situation, um, the reports that we're receiving is that... Um, quite a lot of that has been dialed down. So there were early activity, but it doesn't seem to be being, be being sustained. Uh, the government is developing a comprehensive national program to try and tackle um, the anti-vaxxer messaging, including a whole series of uh, Facebook and other media adverts and interventions, 
and identifying a whole series of community influencers uh, to start promoting uh, the vaccine message and tackling the, the anti-vaccine message. Uh, there's a committee working across London that's trying to pull together all of the agencies, uh, including local authorities, the GLA, the NHS, and using uh, the, uh, the national communications network to try and uh, promote that. So, so significant work is in hand uh, in relation to that, Councillor Stanford. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Aidan, you had a, a if you give benefit of personal experience on, on the vaccinations. I did, Chair. No, thank you very much. Um, I just want to come back on uh, Jed's point and also Brenda's point about the vaccinations and anti-vaxxer. Just to reflect that I've been um, isolating pretty much at home for a year now. And thankfully, I managed to get two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, my wife managed to get one. But just over three weeks ago, we got covid and um, it was really, really tough. But while my symptoms were, you know, they were difficult, but they weren't as bad as they could have been. My wife had more flu-like symptoms. I mean, no doubt that having that vaccine actually helped us out considerably and kept us out of hospital. And then obviously supported the NHS and basically made our recovery much quicker. Um, you know, we, we did all we could. We, we, we kept to ourselves to a minimum. Um, our boy was still going to nursery for obvious reasons because of his development. But, you know, sometimes people do get it and vaccinations are really, really important. So this is that personal sort of lived experience reflection for, for the panel and the work that Jed and others are doing, trying to amplify that message. It's really important. And just thank, thank you for doing that. Mm, thank you, Aidan, from a, a personal perspective. Um, let, let me come to Councillor McCabe. Peter, you've been waiting a long time. Sorry, Chair, I had a problem um, unmuting. Uh, I, I, I feel obliged, Chair, to come back on um, and follow up on your comments in response to Councillor Gretton. Um, there is a long-standing tradition in this council that we do not attack officers. I know Councillor Gretton's not been a councillor for very long and he's still learning, but I think it's long enough now to recognise that we respect officers in this authority and we don't launch uh, attacks on them. And when you get a mild rebuke, and I think it was a mild rebuke, Chair, from you, to hear a councillor say, it wasn't me who started it, just sounds like a conversation that I have with my grandchildren. So some words of advice, if I may, grow up, respect officers at all time, and start to behave like a Merton councillor. Thank you, Peter. I think we'll put it to bed there. Um, yeah. uh, would, in addition... Yeah, no, Chair. Uh, Look, that was totally unnecessary. Um, and I, was, I was going to say, I would thank Jed for... You know, I would appreciate it if you... But I would also you. thank you, Nick, for because I think you put, stated the situation very precisely and carefully. It was and, unfortunate, the whole incident. And we are going to leave it there. Um, and let me thank Jed for taking the time this evening and, and through him, if I can, extend uh, others of you who already mentioned Councillor McKay, Councillor McLean, uh, what we owe to the staff for the effort that they put in over this period, now a long period um, that has become quite gruelling in a way we never anticipated back in March last year. So it's People have kept to the mark, they've kept going a lot longer than I'm sure they ever dreamed they would have to, but that they have been there for, uh, for our residents and, and have given of their best. So Jed, thank you for that. Um, and, and indeed for all you've done to lead the, the council through this, this last, almost this last year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you everybody on, on the committee. Um, okay, good. Um, Next item is the, the budget um, for the third and final time. Um, so let's, let me tell you how we're going to do this. I'm going to ask Caroline to, uh, sorry, our Director of Corporate Services to um, give an introduction of, of where we are on the, the 
the big picture and to update us as far as possible to, to what's been happening in, in, in the last few weeks, because it does seem that this has been characterized by um, very late information, perhaps that's uh, inevitable. Uh, we're then going to look at the savings specific to the, the commission and look at those in, in detail. There, there's really nothing too contentious there, I don't feel. Um, look at the capital program and then the um, consider the references back from the various panels and our own reference back to, to Cabinet for its meeting next week. So, Caroline, can I ask you to uh, start us off with the, the, the big picture? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so, as you said, I think this is sort of the third time I've been to the, the Commission with an update on the budget. So, and I am hoping it is that the last time. Um, but what we, the reason why I think it was so complicated this year, clearly as a result of the, the pandemic, um, it has meant quite a few of the options and proposals that we thought central government would consider around the three-year fair funding review, business rates review, um, just did not take place. So we had a very late settlement on the um, 17th of December, and we had already said by that time that we would be bringing an update to the January cabinet, and therefore would need sort of further scrutiny through the panels and the commission for you to consider potential further savings, the update of the settlement as far as possible, and um, to see where that left us with um, our medium term financial strategy and to the balanced budget for 21-22. So with the report that is in, in front of you tonight, um, it clearly the, the settlement, we had a one year settlement, but that meant there was one year and one-off grants in particular around um, a council tax support grant and a COVID grant. We also have um, first three months of a sales fees and charges grant, and that will be included in the papers which come forward to Cabinet on Monday night. We are hoping to get those published tomorrow. We're just finalising some few things. And indeed, I've even realised uh, um, some um, just last minute checking that there's a, a, an adjustment to be made um, to the papers. So, but they should be published tomorrow. The settlement and fair did a confirm council tax referendum limit of 2%. Um, so that meant our council tax is going to go up by 1.99%, but we were able to do an adult social care preset of 3%. We have been lobbying to see if we could do a social care preset because of the pressures in children's care in particular are becoming as pressing as adults, um, but it does appear at the moment is still the focus on adult social care. There was um, an increase in our overall spending power for the authority, uh, but the majority of that is made up through a council tax increase. So government does assume most all authorities will increase their council tax by the, the maximum levels. We have also updated the issue with regards to our um, dedicated schools grant deficit. We are hoping that is the worst case scenario. There is a working group um, set up chaired by Hannah um, Doody and myself, um, working with officers to look at the issues. And indeed, there was a discussion at the um, Financial Monitoring Task Group last night on this particular area. Um, clearly, there was further adjustments to the capital programme. We are very conscious that it's been a difficult year to progress certain schemes. For example, in our schools to make sure that um, the contractors and children are safe, because as the chief exec said, our schools are, have definitely not been closed throughout this period of time. We have also struggled in some areas with supplies um, just to get those in. So we've asked budget managers to review their capital schemes, if necessary, give up unused resources or slip schemes into future years. Um, and that has helped with the um, financing costs for some of the, the schemes as well. There was a, as part of the delays, we, um, the new homes bonus, we thought there was meant to be a consultation paper on that. That did not happen. So they rolled it forward for a further year, but we have got less money than we had assumed, but there is a, a new lower tier grant um, that we have been given as well that offsets the majority of, of that loss. Um, we did on page, um, ooh, in para um, 3.6, identify some new savings um, as a result of 
trying to reduce that gap. And as you said, we will be considering then those for particular corporate services um, later on. And those are set out on page 50 of the agenda tonight with the draft equality assessments on page 16. When we got to the final position, we had a balanced budget for 21-22 for um, and a gap of just under 6 million for 22-23. What we have done within the budget report that we're coming forward on, on Monday night um, is updated for the collection fund adjustments. Uh, we had to do a return for the business rates elements of the collection fund to um, MHCRG by the 31st of January. And that um, took into account an increase in our bad debts provision and also an increase in um, the provision for appeals. So we still have some appeals against previous valuation for businesses dating back to 2010. So that's been a, a particular challenge for us as well as many other authorities. Because of the um, impact of the pandemic on businesses, it was agreed, although we said initially in December that we would sign up to the um, business rates pilot pool for London, it got to the stage where it was not beneficial to all authorities to do so. So there's a, a London-wide agreement that we will not continue with the pool this year, um, but we will be undertaking a shadow pool um, just to see what the impact would have been if we had joined up. And we hope if circumstances improve that we would be in a position to continue for 22-23. I think there were three other pools who have also given notice not to continue for 21-22. For we also sort of updated the assumptions um, where we could, so, but regarding um, the, um, sorry, the um, taxi cars and freedom passes. So the impact of the less journeys um, for people over 65 does benefit the council, but not until 21, 22 and 22, 23 because of the time lag in the number of journeys undertaken. However, um, the, the GLA, because of their shortfall in income have been given special dispensation to increase council tax by a further 15 pounds on top of the 15 pounds for the police element as well as the um, notional GLA element of 1.99%. Um, happy to take questions, Chair. Good. Um, questions for Caroline on what we've just heard. Obviously, uh, Ben, yes, Councillor Butler. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for your report, Caroline, always really detailed and really helpful. Um, can I just ask on that point about the business rates pooling? Um, so you're going to do a shadow, which is um, always good to see, the, the, you know, what could have happened if we uh, had have taken it. But am I right in thinking that the, the purpose of those pools were to um, ease any particularly difficult years in balancing budgets where business rates elsewhere in London would have been able to help us out and vice versa. Is that is that the principle behind it? And are there any kind of similar uh, schemes that we could look forward to in the future where that could be the case where, you know, London's looking out for, for, for each other in that sense? Thank you. Um, so the, the pool we were allowed to do under um, sort of dispensation from the Secretary of State, um, and we did it on the basis that no authority would be in detriment. And indeed, we shared in the benefit of some of the other authorities. But I think just because of the particular losses in certain areas, um, some authorities would have been worse off by entering into the pool than if they stayed alone, because they would have gone, there's a safety um, safety level floor for business rates below which you shouldn't go, but that's removed when you join the pool. So that's why we thought we, we would come out of the pool, but certainly want to make sure that we get the benefit of it going forward, because certainly when we had the higher um, retention levels, we did benefit um, and all the, the boroughs did on, on that basis. So we want to make sure that we can still keep an eye and if needs be continue and join back in 22, 23, other pools have stopped and being able to um, apply again. So we are hopeful that we would be able to do that. Um, with regards to some of the work around offsetting and, and joining and sharing services. So clearly some of the shared services that we have 
um, and indeed with Louise round on um, the, the Zoom meeting this evening, um, sort of managing director of our shared legal services. Um, part of the charging benefits of that is if there's a, a benefit overall um, to the service, then that is shared back out amongst the, the um, five participating boroughs. So there are examples like that where we can set up services um, but we need to find someone who wants to share with us um, and it's how we take benefit and advantage of that. Um, but that's also an area with the regulatory shared um, service with ones with enrichment, you know, it's sort of been progressing um, various services, but clearly with the impact of COVID and their um, very heavy involvement in the test and trace and obviously in the, the Pollard Hill and the surge testing and um, some of the work that we want to do to, to transform that service further. Um, we haven't had the, the ability to be able to do that, but certainly we are always looking to explore services like that. Thank you, Karen. Um, I have a question just, um, just to make sure I'm clear on this. There will be stuff coming to Cabinet on Monday that is not included in the agenda we have before us tonight. There will be no additional savings coming forward. No. No, but there will be an update. So, for example, on the, the collection fund um, and the update on the, the reserves and balances. So that will be included within the papers and the um, level of general fund reserves as well. And will there be, a, I'll just, just be clear, a, a further tranche of um, compensation for lost, um, you know, uh, we have built in an estimate oh, of the sales fees and charges for the first three months for 21-22, yes. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Um, no further questions? I will, in that case, go on to the detail of the, the savings for our panel. Um, Because the agenda has been overprinted, this is a bit of a dog's dinner. Uh, so you've got to look for Appendix 3. Okay. Um, yeah. So... So District Corporate Services has identified a further £200,000 worth of savings. Oh, no, sorry, was it the wrong one? A further £633,000 <laughs> savings for 21-22. Um, but there is um, a reversal of 34 k in 22-23. So there's a one-off saving that then comes out in future years. We have tried to focus very much where we can on looking at running costs, um, budgets that could be given up, or where, I've, for example, canvas reform, for example, is an area where we've got additional grant from the government to help with the way that we can do our canvassing and additional equipment. So therefore we've needed less staff to be able to do that. Um, so that's what we look to do, or maximize our income. For example, that the land charges one um, is an area where there has been a surplus identified. So we're just right-sizing that budget as it were. And then clearly um, we have Chaz, which is our um, local authority trading company, um, and we have an increase in the dividend that will be coming forward from them as well. well happy welcome, isn't it? <laughs> yes, <laughs> but happy to take any um, queries specifically mm. on the, these particular savings. I mean, I mean, these are, as I said, I think at the beginning, relatively uncontentious, but. Are we all clear and we're happy with them? Yep. There's one further saving um, that I'd like to direct you to. This is on, it comes under environment and regen, but it is for us because it's about safer Merton. So if you turn on a couple of pages, particular item is in, environment to 2021 um, and it is a Caroline perhaps you can amplify this but this is a, a staff reduction no 
Um, I suppose I'm just checking if Chris Lee is on the call because that's in his area, whether he could answer the specifics on this one. So I think that it does look like around one member of staff at this moment in time. I want to um, I want to just talk about this a little bit um, because I do recall at uh, I, I followed this through to the uh, the service plan and it assumes a sort of fairly steady state with uh, levels of uh, domestic violence and ASB for, for the years ahead. Yet when I sat in on the Healthier Communities panel the other night, we were told that domestic violence was very much on the rise and it, frankly, that stacks up with what we are learning about you know, the difficulties families experience during the pandemic. Um, I just want to flag that as an area of concern to me that we, we can't simply assume that um, you know, things will come back as they were before. It will, in many respects, be a more troubled and disrupted world. And I'm not entirely comfortable about taking a reduction, one member of staff. I think that takes it from eight to seven, does it, in the, the, the Save for Merton team. But I'd be interested to hear what anyone else might have to, to, to say about that. So I if I were to propose that we, we did not take that saving, um, would anyone be prepared to support that? Or Chris, sorry, perhaps I should allow you to, to comment before we go forward on this. Can you help? Yeah, yeah certainly, Chair. Um, we're not absolutely clear how that saving will be taken at the moment. It could be taken across efficiency savings in a staffing reorganisation in, in the CCTV section uh, and or across the Safer Merton team generally. We do have a vacancy there uh, and I know your focus in your comments was around domestic violence. Um, most of the work around domestic violence is funded from MOPAC resources that we access and we've been successful in accessing funding for independent domestic violence advocates. Uh, we do have some capacity within the core team to support that, uh, that team of independent domestic violence advocates, but we are fortunate that we're supported by the MOPAC funding, uh, the Crime Prevention Fund. So we haven't yet concluded how we would find the, the exact uh, amount that's in the saving, but we're confident we'd be able to do that whilst protecting the core services as I say, most of which are funded externally. Okay, well, let, let me get some feeling as to whether members are, are happy with uh, the director's reassurance on that point and prepared to let that, that proposed saving stand. Um, So I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing dissent. So we, we will let the, uh, the saving stands, but I, there is a wider point there that I, we perhaps might want to come back to uh, towards the end. Um, can, I, can we come on to the capital program? This is appendix five. It's quite a long appendix. Um, So we've, we set out the, the capital strategy, how, it's the pro, how we fund the program, um, the level of grants that we get, um, and then have identified shown that this, the schemes, um, what we call an annex three for the forthcoming four years, and then an indicative program for some of the block schemes in future years after that. Um, as you will see, there's a um, significant program still within children's schools and families with the focus moving from primary schools to secondary schools, and then now on in particular to our, our special schools, um, as well as some of the, the block funding within environmental regeneration. 
I would say that the um, unallocated TfL monies are an assumption at this stage. And uh, they've told us that we should assume the same level of funding going forward, but that will of course depend on their overall funding going forward as well. Um, but as you can see, sort of the bridges and highways and works for um, the, the leisure centres and, and the council aggression, the paddling pools still. Um, so just to, to draw your attention, as well as within um, corporate services, the investment within buildings and within our IT in, in particular. Okay. Questions for Carolyn on the capital programme. I see none. I, I have I have one, Carolyn. It's very specific, actually. This is the on the detail capital programme for uh, corporate services. And there's an item... Compulsory purchase order Clarion, uh, it's 4.8 million. Yes. And a further 2.4 for the year after that. So Clarion is part of their um, three estates regeneration, um, has said in worst case scenario, whilst they have been offering to buy back um, leaseholder properties in the event that they are unable to um, persuade people to do that, they would like to be able to undertake compulsory purchase orders. However, they as a housing association do not have the authority to do so. The local authority only has the authority, but it would be done on a, what we call a back-to-back -back basis. So Clarion would pay us the money, but we still need to put it into the program in the first instance. But it, we are assuming that we get that money directly back and therefore no net impact on the um, Merton. Okay, thank you. So we're, we're, we're not at risk on it. It's, it's a, yeah. We should not be at risk, no, because yeah. we wouldn't put those um, CPOs in place unless we had confirmation from Clarion that they were able mm. to pay us that money. Mm. Good. OK, if there are no further questions, we'll come now to consider the references from the panels. Um, which I have here. Um, let me ask the, the uh, Chair of Healthy Communities first, um, Council McCabe, do, do you want to add any comment on your uh, request that Cabinet reconsider the, uh, the, the uh, proposal to take savings from the in-house daycare provision? Chair, yeah, I think the uh, note speaks for itself. Um, I have nothing to add. Okay, so that clearly it is our practice as a commission not not to uh, amend uh, representations from the panels. I like the panels to speak for themselves and be autonomous. Um, Councillor Mundy, if I come to you for the Sustainable Communities panel, uh, do you wish to add or uh, enlarge on anything? No, sorry, can we see what we're talking about? Oh. Um, right. If they're not as part of the agenda, that's that's difficult. Sorry, let me in which, read it out. Let me ask um, Aidan. Can somebody share? Can can somebody put it on screen? For yeah, me? chair. I was just about to say I could share it on screen. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Rosie. Can everybody see that? That's fine. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Chair, so it's um, Aidan. <coughs> Just going back to your, your initial uh, question, I've got nothing further to add. Um, as, as Like Peter, I think they, they stand for themselves and quite clear, but happy to take any uh, questions other members of the panel who weren't on the, who, who weren't a part of the deliberations may have for rationale, if it's helpful. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Aidan. Um, unless there's any <laughs> dissent, we will pass those through uh, as, as part of our referral back to Cabinet. Can we just have a minute to read them? Hmm? I don't understand why these haven't been sent out. It seems bizarre to me. Uh, can we at least have a minute to read them in silence? Okay, okay.
Thanks. Right. So I, I would add that I've received um, two representations this evening on, on the, the healthier communities item uh, within about an hour of the meeting starting, which uh, you know, I, I, I would like to record that I read them, but it, it was a, perhaps a little late in the day. So um, we've, we've had a chance, we can all, and if no one has questions, we'll, if we can go back to the, um, the screen view, Rosie. Thank you. Sorry, Peter, I was hoping to ask a question, one of them is that you Yeah. Sorry, Ed, you, yeah? Thank you, Bon, yeah. I had, a, I had a question on, on one, the, the second one, if, I'm, if now's the time, just to, to ask a question on the sustainable communities reference back. Um, what it was is it, I think C Councillor Draper and, and Councillor Brunt have been talking about um, the work of environment regeneration workers and so on. And Councillor Brunt was, I think, was um, talking about the workers in our, in our parks and on our streets, but it was rather confusing by way of the reference because Councillor Brunt and Councillor Draper, um, Councillor Brunt, of course, is I think the Labour cabinet member now of the administration, he didn't seem to, to realise that the workers in our parks and on our streets who are doing the street cleaning contracting are not actually council employees anymore. Those services were outsourced several years ago. So when you go into one of our parks, you see the, you know, the, the, the staff of our excellent contractor ID Fair Day, um, when you see people cleaning our streets, as they're meant to be doing, um, you see they, those are not council workers. They are workers of the Peolia, who, who the council pays, you know, something towards £10 million a year to their outsourced services. So it just doesn't make any sense at all for somebody like Councillor Brunt, who's the cabinet member, to be talking about our part workers as if they are council workers when he doesn't seem to realise that the whole service, despite the fact he's in charge of those services, those entire services are outsourced. So it, I'm just struggling to understand the sense of Councillor Drayton and Councillor Brunt's references because they, they seem to have no understanding at all that these are not no longer council workers. A few years ago, those services to be earlier and ID Verde were outsourced. So it makes little sense for us to be, you know, just, I'm just asking what the sense is. It's hard to understand what, what they meant by this. I don't know if anyone can offer any more detail on that, particularly as the earlier and ID Verde are outsourced services. Um, does anyone want to respond? I mean, I, uh, a number of them were uh, Merton workers in the past. Um, I recognise them still in our parks. And I think I, I think you you we understand your point, but I don't think we want to make an ideological distinction between workers who are outsourced and those who are in house. Um, okay. Let me ask Councillor McLean, did you want to come forward, Nick? You, you've kindly indicated in advance that you would like to put down a, a, a reference. Indeed, I would, Chair. Together. Thank you very yeah. much. I have sent it to you and Rosie already. I'll send it to all panels in a moment, but I'll just read it out. Uh, the OSC support, uh, the reference I'd like to put down, uh, proposed, supported by and seconded by Councillor Gretton, is the OSC supports the hard work of Merton Council staff during the pandemic especially frontline staff working with our most vulnerable residents. However, the current administration has chosen to spend £316,000 on an extra day off for staff members, when that money could have been used to support local businesses and aid Merton's economic recovery. Therefore, the Commission requests Cabinet to look again at offering additional financial support to local businesses to the level of £316,000. Thank you. I'm now sending it to all panellists for review. Thank you, I have that now. I think that's very straightforward to understand. Um, I'm happy to take questions on, on why I proposed it. Anybody have questions for, for Nick? Can I say just in advance, I don't want, I hope I don't need to say it, but I don't want political point scoring here. If you've got a, a genuine question by way of understanding or interpretation, then do please ask it. Yeah, can I say, can I um, make the suggestion that we don't get involved in political argument, as you very wisely suggested, 
and move immediately to a vote on this. Well, let me let me ask Ben if if, if his, the nature of his question. If it's for information, then go ahead, Ben. If you if. <laughs> Uh, I was going to try and craftily avoid a political point um, to kind of reference what the chief executive has already described as the, the business support that we've already had, but I'm happy to move to a vote to kind of shorten this conversation as well. Okay. Paul, I'm looking for an original point of view here. Uh, I, there, is a, there is a real issue that our businesses need more business support. I don't quite understand why it's been tied to the day's holiday, which of course cost the administration nothing. This is why they were given a day's holiday. They weren't given extra money. So yes, we should support businesses. This idea that the holiday has cost the administration 316,000 is of course completely bogus. We've asked this question of Councillor, uh, sorry, Director Holland often, and that's the figure she gave us. Um, so we haven't made that up. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, Paul, you know as well, you, we, we attended many meetings, or, and, we've, and, I, and with Stephen Hammond also, when we met with the, the, the former leader and also um, uh, the chief exec, et cetera, and, and we tried to get some discretion used. Now, of course, that wasn't forthcoming. I do appreciate there were, were difficulties, but I'm asking now, okay, the staff who've worked hard have been given an extra day off. All I'm asking now is for this, for those businesses that failed or fell out down through the cracks, like the English speaking schools, here's an opportunity to say, you know what? Yes, we, we understand that the staff have worked hard and, and they'll be given an extra day off. But there are other people out there struggling too. Local businesses, event companies. Here's the opportunity to say, okay, you know, we're all in this together, to put coin a phrase, and let's show that we are. And, let, and if it's got to come out of reserves, you know, and we have asked our Director Holland this question, and we'll hopefully receive an answer very shortly, you know, what are the reserves there for, if not for a rainy day? This is not a big amount of money, but a gesture has been made to the, to the, uh, the staff employees of this council. Let's make a similar gesture. To those businesses that are struggling out there who are many. Thank you Nick. I'm going to ask Caroline to uh, to comment and then we're going to go to a vote. So I suppose just to clarify um, we've estimated it as a notional cost of £316,000 so staff have been awarded an additional day um, but we need to wait until the year end to see if they have actually taken it and um, there is a limit on the amount of leave that people can carry forward. So if they haven't taken all of their leave, then they may lose some of their leave. We are encouraging staff to take their leave um, as much as possible. Um, so we remain to, to see how much um, leave, additional leave is actually taken. But this is about the message it sends to our communities and our businesses. And that is my point. It has been my point right along. I don't want to drift in, but that is always the thing. I don't begrudge at all, the hardworking staff an extra day off. But I think when so many businesses, when discretion potentially could have been used but was not, why we can't make that gesture now and look to support? And I know that Councillor Cola was very uh, vocal on this point too. We're going to a vote. Um, all those in favour of the reference that uh, uh, Councillor McLean has tabled and seconded by Councillor Grattan I count three now. Um, the problem is for Councillor Stanford, I won't have had a chance to see that. Um, but can I just see those against? Um, uh, oh, sorry, lost my void. Um, is that, that, that's Peter, is it? Sorry. It is, yes. Uh, yes, sir. No, um, uh, I'm uh, against. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. So that would appear to be um, six against and three for. We satisfy there. So the, the reference doesn't go forward. Um, I've drafted a reference which I hope will win your support, but obviously that, that's for you to decide. Uh, Rosie, can, can you put that onto the screen for us? Yes, Chair, give me. One second, please. Oh. 
Okay, I hope you've all got better eyesight than I have. Um, let, if I can just briefly summarise here, I'm saying that the, the pandemic has created pressures we've never experienced before. Um, and there are a lot of uncertainty. Uh, as the, the fog clears and we um, start to see the future, particularly on the financial front, you know, the situation I'm really saying could improve, but whatever happens, Merton is going to be a very, very different place once we come out of this. So we've already talked about this a little bit this evening, but two, two things that really could make a difference would be the payment of the remaining tranches of um, compensation for the loss of sales fees and charges. And the other would be some movement on the dedicated, the deficit on the dedicated schools grant, um, which is just huge and growing, as we know. Um, both those developments would help enormously with uh, balancing the budget and perhaps would avoid the use of, of reserves uh, both this year and next year to, 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 uh, to, uh, to balance the budget. Those reserves could be reinstated. Um, thinking not about money, but about our, about our people, about our residents. It is clear that there will be lasting damage, particularly for the most vulnerable members of our, our society. There will be children who've, who've lost schooling and that within that, there will be a differential disadvantage for those who don't get the level of support at home that, that uh, luckier children do. Um, those who've been isolated for the best part of a year, or those with disabilities, we know they are more prone to death or even uh, from, from uh, COVID and those with, with mental health issues. Statistically, we know these groups are particularly disadvantaged. And then we have the long running um, extent of inequalities between the east and west of the borough, and I've been councillor for quite a long time, but we have not brought those down. This surely must exacerbate those inequalities because of the extent to which the, the, the COVID has uh, affected those in poor housing, poor health, overcrowded conditions. So there was a two, these are two things that uh, the cabinet will have to think about, and will have to accommodate um, in the years ahead for the, the, the four years of the MTFS um, to, to meet the needs of these, these very vulnerable people. It will not be business as, as before. And finally, I make the point just echoing what the LGA have said, um, how important it is that local government be compensated in full for the financial impact of the pandemic. Okay, so. So Chair, you, you're making, you're asking the OSC to refer a reference back on the payments for the remaining chances of compensation loss, income, sales and fees, and the settlement of a deficit of dedicated schools grant. Well, no one can argue with that, but they're outside the Cabinet's remit. That's national government. I don't understand the point of it. Um, and so for that, I just, I don't see what, what you're trying to achieve. This is very, very political, isn't it? Um, well, discounting that whether it's political or not, I, I'm, I'm going to ask Caroline. Um, Caroline, you often talk about um, planning for the worst and hoping for the best. Um, and this, this, I, I guess this is talking about the hope element. Um, on a scale from one to ten, where one is the worst and 10 is the best. Where are you now currently on, on the, the hope spectrum? Where do you score? And the budget or me personally? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, like, I, in, you know, as we get news of, of uh, changes, some improvements in our financial situation coming very late in the day, how are you reading those? How are you feeling about them? So I think when we first did the update of the business plan back in September, we looked at sort of um, a high level recovery, um, even level recovery and a low level recovery. And 
we actually budgeted um, on the even level recovery. And I think there have been some elements which have improved. Um, but the fact is that some of the grants that we've received are one-offs um, is just a concern over the length of the, the medium term. So I would say we've, I've probably moved from a seven to a five. So as in it's, it's better than um, I thought it was when we were doing the budget back in September. Um, but there's still some way to go if, uh, or if I got it the wrong way around, five to a seven, if one was really bad and 10 was good. So um, uh, it, I think the, the budget is not as bad as it was, but still not as good as it could be. Um, yeah, and I'm yeah. hoping with what we've set in place, it's not as bad as it could have been. No, thank you. Thank, and, uh, so a, a rising trend, but certainly not uh, a long way short of where we might like to be. Correct. Um, do you want me to leave that on the screen or can we go back to full screen so I can see who wants to, to comment? Can, um, Rosie, can you take us back on to, um, to full screen? Um, I take Nick's point, he feels we're, uh, Brenda. Thank you, Chair. I've just been listening to this discussion about paying staff. But at the CYP meeting, we had a long discussion on exactly that matter. And so it's coming up again. But I remember um, Hannah Dowdy saying that in fact, although this was offered to these staff members who haven't taken any time off, they've been busy there. Okay, you can't see them, I can't see them, but we know that they're there looking after the vulnerable people. Uh, most of them haven't taken it up anyway. So I can't imagine why we're back to this again. And I do know about businesses, but businesses are suffering because of the pandemic and the closure of their business. And if they're not essential, then they're not going to be open. So we'd have to be compensating the whole country more or less if we look at that. So I, I'm not quite sure how the council is supposed to be compensating. Um, the businesses. Well, thank you, Brenda. I, I think you're addressing the previous proposed reference, which we've now voted on. And I, I'm now asking for comment, if any, on, on this proposed reference back to Cabinet. Okay. Ben, thank you. Yeah, and um, thank you, uh, Chair, um, for bringing this forward. I, I think it's um, good to talk about the hope I and mean, I think I'd be happy to support this um, going back um, especially kind of laying out even if they are national government considerations laying out the you know how we've considered their impact on us so I, I think that's, that's important so more of a comment from me there Chair. Thank, mm, you. thank you. Councillor Mundy. Thanks Chair. Um, I just want to echo what, what Ben just said but also um, for my own panel as well, we're, we're going to, you know, in our, in our next phase of, of, of looking at the service plans, we're looking at recovery, we're looking at the next steps and your recommendation, your thoughtful reflection for the cabinet does that as well in, in light. Um, so it's quite helpful there and there are still, as you said, there are still outstanding issues relating to the uh, scores grant and various other things we've already discussed. Um, earlier on in the um, in the evening, so I found it quite helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Kohler, uh, I'm sorry, so I'm losing my screen. Um, I've got nothing uh, against that. I'm not sure what what particular good it will do, but I have nothing <laughs> against it. Um, I, I think there are issues here, and Nick uh, mentioned one which is really important. Now I know Carol and I disagree on this, but I think the council took a far too doctrinaire approach to the rules on mandatory grants and on business rate support. It took a risk averse view because it, unlike other councils, I don't want to litigate that now, Caroline, but I think we as a scrutiny committee must look at that because many companies in Merton didn't get the support that other companies did in other parts of the country because because some councils were willing to take a more robust approach knowing that they might have a fight with government afterwards about getting the money back but that's something I think we need to address so moving forward that's what I would like us to say as a scrutiny committee we must look at I might be wrong 
but I've got lots of evidence of other councils that went further than us on the margins on the rules of, of business rate support and on mandatory grants. And I think we need at least to look at that. Thank you, Paul. I mean, you're not tabling that for, for tonight. You're saying that that's future business, really. Or, or a reference back that we are going to do that. Yes, OK, some, at some point I want us to resolve that tonight that we will look mm. into. Let me come on to Councillor um, Peter. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Geraldine, come in. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, I'd, ju uh, I'd just like to, uh, to say um, initially, uh, yes, I, I, I would support uh, yeah, your, your proposals. Um, uh, and I just wanted to add that we, we, you know, we must be, we, we must be so used now to guidance coming out, you know, every day, every week, whatever, uh, changing on a very, you know, <laughs> on a very frequent basis. So we have to take a flexible, a flexible approach to this, you know, and, and think, well, we thought this was a good idea at the time, but the guidance and, and, and the recommendations from, from the government have changed so much during, during the the past few months, that we need to be able to, to be flexible and to think, well, we'll have a rethink about that that issue that we um, uh, put forward a bit before. So, so yes, I, I support uh, your, your proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Come to Councillor Gretton, then I think perhaps we'll go for a... Yeah, I, I think... Peter, where, where, you have to sort of step back a little bit and think where we are in the scrutiny process. And we've had three big rounds of scrutiny and, and pretty much through all of that time, we've been told that um, you know, there's going to be these huge budget deficits. We're going to have to find millions and millions of pounds for, but you know, in front of us is a figure of zero budget deficit. So I don't think we've really been through a meaningful scrutiny. I mean, we're, we're still... You know, being told that some of the numbers or additional funding, whatever it is, Robert Jenrick's extra you know, compensation for loss of income, some of those figures are still not in. Um, they haven't been accounted for. There's still two big multi-million pound pots, which you know, are going to be three million pounds plus, probably, which have, have not been included. So I don't think we are in a position where you know, there's, there's been sufficient detail in front of us. And you know, if, the, if numbers are, are provisional, we should say, well, there's a range here, so it may well reduce a budget deficit of whatever it is. But we haven't really been through that process. And had we been through that process, and that, I think we'd be able to be a much better you know, assessment, if you like, of, of pushing back and saying, there needs to be more money coming from wherever um, for local authorities. And uh, so I, I'm just not convinced that we've, we've had in our three rounds of scrutiny as much information as we, as we might have, have liked and also on the, on the DSG as well we know we've got an issue there which is a growing one and I think it was a year ago I asked the cabinet member for um, education could they please set out and we had the same conversations you know in the last day or so for the plea for the council please set out as a matter of scrutiny what steps the council is taking to to build capacity, to make use of extra funds, to apply for extra grants, to build in-house capacity for education, so it doesn't need the independent placements, which are just behind the, the cost of the, the DSG deficit. And I asked that a year ago, and I asked it again last night. It's taken us a year, scrutiny-wise, to sort of say, well, maybe we should be calling for these things. But again, we haven't really had those in de detailed, properly, proper papers that set out the causes of a deficit. And because of those, I, 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 I just don't think it's right for us to be saying unanimously that we, um, we, we can form a conclusion on this when we haven't been through that process and we, we haven't had the numbers in front of us. Well, Ed, I think, um, I mean, we went into this in some length last night, didn't we? Uh, um, and I do think Caroline and her team have been going flat out to keep pace through a very difficult year indeed with, with very late information coming in. Carolyn, I don't know whether you want to comment there, but... Um, I suppose the collection fund, we can only finalise that after we've done our, our return, which is due at the end of um, January. So there is very little new information that will be coming forward for the February cabinet, um, but it's at the finalisation once we have everything together. So we've had the capital programme, 
you have to bring all of that together to then work out what the, the revenue financing costs of that are. Um, the new savings. So if you actually look at the total level of savings that we have um, in the, the scheme of things compared to previous year, we have less savings than we would normally have. Yes. Um, so we have actually relied on sort of almost the balance in the budget reserve and one off grants to um, balance the budget. But that's not sustainable in the longer term. Hence the need to then keep under review what we need to do going forward. The DSG recovery plan was reported to Cabinet back in um, January 2020. Um, clearly, we've now had a, a change in director. The DFE were meant to be coming back to assist us, but they um, have been busy and haven't come back to visit us. So we're sort of we're following an, up on what needs to be done. Um, and that did include at that time expanding provision of our special schools, um, which has some of that has already been done. And there is further provision in the capital program to do that. But those additional places are already built in to keeping that deficit down. Otherwise the deficit would be even higher. Mm. No, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Mundy, and then we're going to uh, to vote on this one. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's just a, ref a reflection both on, on Paul's point, but Geraldine's, I mean, I think Paul's point may be a matter for the business, uh, uh, the full business plan at the, the end of the, the meeting, but it raises a wider point about, um, actually going on slightly ahead's point as well about getting and calling the weeds of all this because this is still as Geraldine said a very live situation uh, you know we've been through two rounds of, of, of pandemic to a degree with maybe a third we don't know um, and as Caroline said we need to look to the medium to long term in this so perhaps when we meet not now but obviously in the future look at our future business plan how can we have that helicopter view of the service this is whether through a service blueprint or some other type of of mechanism, perhaps not traditional to scrutiny, but that way we can actually understand uh, the overall picture rather than sometimes. And I, I find myself getting into this as well. You end up getting caught in the weeds sometimes. Well, actually, you're not looking at the bigger picture and what the risks and, and variables were at the time. Thank you. So if I can ask now for those um in favour of the, the proposed reference back. You are unmuted. So I think I have a... It's, 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 it's yes. Geraldine. Yeah. I'm, I'm in favour. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you, Geraldine. Um, yeah, I'm abstaining. So is it... A, abstaining, yeah. Abstaining. yeah. Eight, eight in favour and two abstentions. Okay. Uh, okay, and, and thank you very much for that. So that concludes the uh, our scrutiny of the budget and reference back to to cabinet for when I have to go and see them on Monday. Um, would you like a five minute break before we go on to the call in? I know Daniel's been sitting there patiently, but uh, I, I think yeah, we've been going a little bit short of two hours, so. Nature calls. And right. if I take yeah. my leave of you then, Chair, as well. Thank you. Yes, and thank you again, Caroline, for all your, your support, not just tonight, but throughout the process. Thank you, Chair. Good, thank you. So exactly nine o'clock now by my watch, but we'll reconvene at five minutes past. My watch is fast, I think. Okay.
Can you hear me there, Dan? I can, David. I can. Uh, you done it? Are you keeping up your steps? I am still six thousand short today, so I'm going to have to go do my active travel as soon as this meeting is over. And um, because I've been on a quite uh, a long streak of doing ten thousand steps a day, I've managed it all, all the way since last November. Very good. Probably one of the most active travelling councillors in the council. So it's been about 50 days, 40 days, and uh, you're 6,000 behind. That's not bad. It's not bad at all. Rosie. Hi, Peter. Hi. Either of the two witnesses we were um, asked to speak to the call in, Do, have we heard from them? We have, yeah. Unfortunately, they both politely declined. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. So we're just waiting. Councillors McCabe and Gretton, are we? Yeah. Oh, will you be there? Thank you. We're just waiting, Councillor McCabe, are we? Right, I'm going to make a start. I'm conscious we have a, a lot of officers uh, as well as cabinet members supporting this. So um, this is a 
calling on uh, emissions-based parking charges, which has been declared valid by our, our monitoring officer. Um, I, I think the, the subject will be familiar to many, and it has also been uh, subject to fairly extensive pre-decision scrutiny. Um, I hope I don't need to say this, but I will anyway. We, we had a call in just a month ago. Uh, members behaved well and, and conducted that in a, um, you know, a professional way, and I would ask you to do exactly the same tonight. Uh, I'm going to ask Councillor Holden to, to lead on this. Uh, we will then ask him any questions that we have. Um, and Chris Lee, as the director, will respond. Uh, it's then for us as, as the members to debate the issues and to decide whether um, the matter should be referred back to Cabinet for reconsideration or, or not, in essence. So, uh, yeah, Councillor Holden, floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, and I uh, just want to point out that Councillor Dean will say a few words after I finish speaking. So, uh, good evening, members of the Overview and Scrutiny Commission. Uh, it's good to see you all here tonight. Uh, the Conservative Group have called in this decision because we think the emissions-based parking charges uh, fails on the following areas that we've outlined in our report. Uh, a, proportionality, as the actions are disproportionate to the desired objectives. Uh, part C, where we think it harms human rights and equalities aspects. Uh, part D, decision was not open. Uh, it was our view as it was predetermined long before it uh, came to public attention. Uh, part E, aims and outcomes not clear. And part F, uh, no effort has gone into looking at alternatives. Uh, so I'll expand on a couple of those. Um, it is our view that charging a very small section of the public a huge increase in parking fees is disproportionate to the aim of improving air quality across the whole borough. The council is asking a very small amount of residents to pay a lot, even if they are not demonstrably contributing to the problem, as park cars, as you no doubt know, do not pollute. A lot of residents I've spoken with think this policy is potentially open to legal challenge because it is such a narrow number of residents being targeted and therefore discriminated against. The fact that there is also a particular geographic bias um, in the policy against Wimbledon and Baines Park in particular has been ignored in the council documents, uh, but the public have noticed uh, this. Uh, we also think the policy does harm the elderly and it makes their lives much more difficult uh, regarding having family and visitors come to assist them and the visit. The last uh, second uh, edit by the cabinet um, does uh, not, in our view, go far enough in mitigating the negative impact on the elderly uh, that was mentioned in the Equalities Impact Assessment. The elderly generally prefer to rely on the paper permits and the um, visitor permits, and the council are making this the default expensive option. Uh, this discriminates against the elderly, in our opinion. It is our view that this aspect of the policy needs serious review by the Council. In terms of clear aims, um, the Council also claims that the reduction in permits during 2020 was a result of last year's parking uh, fees rise. Now, what the Council fails to appreciate is that no improvement in desired outcomes were met because most of the reduction was due to people putting their cars off road or outside of the, uh, CPZs, so they did not require a permit. It was not because they gave up their cars. Um, the council can't point to any improvements in the outcomes either, partly because of the baseline data and monitoring is poor or non-existent. Um, I'm going to pass on to David to add a few particular points. Um, conscious of time, so I don't want to say too much more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. David. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, the idea that taxing polluting vehicles in areas of poor air quality died when Labour politicians realised that air quality is worse in wards where they sit. And a tax on pollution in those wards would lead to more objections than any other policy. So areas of poor air quality have been ignored, even though this has meant that residents might suffer health problems. Instead, we have a scheme which has been cooked up to tax parked cars which admit minuscule uh, emissions, 
where pollution does not exceed legal levels. Hence, we have a lie, it is mitigating poor air, upon a lie that parked cars emit pollution, upon a lie that cars are responsible. The facts are commercial vehicles and large combustion engines driven in pollution hotspots need addressing. This policy does not address these issues. It's a tax grab. The resident response in Wimbledon and Rains Park, gardens are being ripped up across those areas to avoid the tax, meaning dramatically diminished greenery, the worst thing for air quality and climate change. Roads like Toynbee Road and Burstow Road, unbelievably 50 to 60 of the homes of 70 or 80 have had their gardens ripped up um, for on off-street parking. Now, the sad fact is I'm not sure that we're going to get proper questions here because the facts are that this policy is wrong and what we're saying is right. I hope that uh, we do get those questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. Do we have questions from members for either Daniel or David at this stage? Um, yes, Ed, please. Um, is it? Th thanks very much. Well, well, thanks very much, both of you, for, for providing a, a, a very sort of clear um, um, description of, of the call-in. Um, wh where are most of the pollution hotspots in the borough? Is it, is it the case that there are quite a lot of them in Mitcham, and, and that you know, the pollution um, in, 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 in Mitcham in the east of a borough is just not going to be addressed in any way? Um, by, by, by these charges. Um, so thank you for the question, Ed. Uh, so there are pollution hotspots in, in most of the key town centre locations. Um, so there's one or two in Wimbledon, but there's a significant number in Morden and Mitcham and Collieswood as well. And these proposals by the council uh, have no measures to help those hotspot locations. Um, in fact, the pollution hotspots are known to be uh, caused by not parked cars by residents, but more by the HGVs, taxis, commercial vehicles, uh, bus network and, and such like, and all the food traffic that's coming from elsewhere. Um, not a single aspect of this new uh, proposal will actually help on those matters. We come to uh, Councillor Kohler, Paul. Thank you. Well, whilst I, I agree, I'm as opposed as you to this tax on not voting Labour. This is a call-in. It's a call-in on specific issues. Uh, I'm a bit disappointed with both Councillor Holden and Councillor Dean's submissions thus far. What I was hoping you'd do is you'd actually respond to the responses from officers and show how they're wrong, because I think they are wrong in various things, but what we need is an anal analysis of why you think their response to your your, your, your complaint is not well founded. That's what we need to do now. We need to be a little, little more analytical, not argue, re, re litigate the case. Father, well, we want to come back on that. Uh, yeah, so um, it's not re litigating a case. Um, we were asked if we wanted to um, complete a form called a call in and make a presentation. So uh, nobody at some stage said, would you like to relitigate a case? If they had, we wouldn't be here. And um, I'm not quite sure why, why this can't be seen. This is clearly an emotional policy because the fact, let's get specific. If this was about air quality, then uh, you would see a very different map across the borough. This isn't about air quality. This is about looking at uh, elections and deciding uh, how we're going to uh, ensure we keep our vote up there. And the, and the trouble is with this, I mean, as an environmentalist, this should always be above politics. The trouble with this is that if you look at the east of the borough, I constantly hear politicians telling me that people there die younger and they lead unhealthier lives. And it is true. So you need to start mitigating what the issues are. Now, if pollution in those areas specifically exceeds the levels um, which has been uh, 
legally um, explained by, I think, the Court of European Union. Paul, I know you're an expert on the European Union, and I know you're an expert on law, so I'm sure you'll put me wrong if I'm not correct. But I do believe your friends in the EU have told us that we exceed legal levels of pollution in those areas. Why is it the Council is ignoring the European Union and ignoring that law and not helping the health of people in what you call the Left EU? Right? OK, let me... Um, uh, uh, I, I think there are a number... Uh, Nick, and then I get to come to Chris Lee. There we go. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, to, uh, both to Daniel and David, I know they both sit on the Suscoms um, uh, scrutiny panel. And you know, what, what statistical evidence can be has been produced um, to prove air quality will be improved by the emission-based parking charges? Has, was that ever presented to the uh, scrutiny panels, Dan? Um, no, there's been no evidence uh, that shows that this policy would actually make a difference or show any improvements. Um, it's without metrics. Um, that, the only thing the council and cabinet can point to is is a desire to reduce car ownership because they don't like private car ownership. That's the only real metric they've provided. And they've not even shown clear evidence of that so far because most of last year's so-called reduction was um, due to reasons I've already outlined. I'm going to come to... Can I thought, just quick follow up? I, I do yeah. agree with that point, actually, because within some of the answers here, it clearly says, you know, the the the, the ultimate aim here is uh, reduce car ownership. So it really, as it's just the minute, would you agree the administration is just uh, following through on their anti-car agenda? Um, yes, I would agree with that statement. OK, um, I'm going to come to Councillor Mundy, um, who chairs the Sustainable Communities Panel. But I can't resist saying in passing that I've been a councillor for almost 20 years, and even when I first became a councillor, the it was pretty clear from the um, uh, the policy papers that the aim was to encourage active travel, walking, cycling, and and to to discourage car use. So nothing has really changed there. Uh, but I think I should shut up now, Councillor Mundy. Yeah. Never chair, never shut up. Keep talking. <laughs> uh, so no, just say no. Thanks very much. Uh, Dan and David, really, really appreciate you you bring this to our attention again. Um, so what I just want to say that I think, obviously, from a London-wide perspective, many councils are following suit, and this is a, a, a new way, and obviously we want to revisit this, and that's why we agree that uh, at the panel that when it's implemented, we would get a regular report from users affected to understand any mitigations that can be put in. And it was very welcome to have uh, both your support on that and the support of the panel and that of officers. I would just, it'd be great if we can touch back on, back in, Peter just mentioned this actually, the, the whole point of the policy is active travel and behavior change and moving people to uh, uh, more sort of active forms. Could you reiterate perhaps any of your recommendations or, or thoughts at the time um, that may enhance this policy and make it more palatable for you? That, you, that may have been missed out, that which, given the current financial situation, are achievable, you think? So, so um, may I, Chair, answer that? So uh, yes. I think, thank you very much for that. I mean, the disappointment for me is, is I, I see some Labour councillors smiling. Um, it doesn't matter to them what happens to the people of Mitcham. Uh, they can just have a laugh and they can die younger and they can have pollution, it doesn't matter. I understand that you're not, you weren't, you didn't grow up in the area. You don't go to the area that often. Uh, you know, I did grow up in the area. Uh, I do. Uh, a lot of my family still live in Mitcham, Pollard's Hill, etc. Um, and, and we face all the issues uh, all of the time. But you know, if if you're you know from a more middle class background, you don't um, wouldn't want to live in Mitcham and you don't visit there. I understand that. Uh, I feel differently. I get very emotional about the places I grew up, and I know what the issues are. Um, I think what we should have had is metrics which specifically look at pollution hotspots. It's not about raising money. I don't think people's health, and I've heard this tonight, is about raising money. I don't think it is about taxation. And I don't think it's about cars. It's about pollution and health. And the metrics need to be based on what pollution we have in a borough and find ways to mitigate it. And this doesn't do it. Um, it taxes parked cars in areas with clean air. And either parts of those are wrong. And that's what I'm saying. So we need metrics 
where is the pollution? And I'd like to see that um, each meeting, where is the pollution? Where is it exceeding legal levels? Um, I'll just Thank quickly you. add that um, more direct response to Council Monday's uh, question. Um, at the December meeting of the Sustainable Communities Panel, we did try to uh, consider some options, uh, but they were not well received by colleagues. They didn't, in fact, they didn't even want to hear them out at all. But uh, ideas such as a, a low, uh, it's a view I share with one of the other uh, councillors who's not here today, which was a low mileage uh, rebate, um, that would work quite well. Um, discounts on those who within, let's say, the period of a year or two within new change happening, you could look at if somebody switches their car to a cleaner one, give them a, uh, a rebate on, on their parking permit to, uh, to reward good behaviour. Uh, as you know, I've always in the panels spoken about carrots rather than sticks, um, and there's been no incentives offered at all in, in this policy. Um, I'd also think that the elderly uh, particularly should have more um, sort of uh, cheaper sort of visitor permit passes. Uh, the What was on offered by the cabinet was really just tokenistic. Um, it doesn't actually help that many people. So uh, sort of in incentives to encourage the right behaviour is where I'm at. Um, and people on this panel may not be aware that I was also trying to bring in a e-bike hire scheme a couple of years back that fell on deaf ears uh, from somebody with an administration. Um, so we do come up with all, all sorts of ideas to help with active travel. And as people know, I'm quite a key proponent of active travel in the borough. Um, in terms of uh, dealing with uh, buses, um, there was a motion that council did a couple of years back uh, to ask TfL uh, to bring in the low emission bus zones in our key town centres. That was never implemented or followed through. Um, so there are a whole range of measures that we uh, think would work better, um, but uh, there are just a few uh, that would be good if, if, if they could be incorporated. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Daniel. I, I, I'm going to turn now to uh, Chris Lee, our, our director. Um, Chris, you, you prepared quite a detailed uh, response here, but is, is there anything you, you want to provide an overview or, or, or add to what's been said? Yeah, if, if you'll permit me, Chair, I wanted to just um, perhaps say a few words about the context within this is uh, that, mm. that, that this policy proposal is brought, and then just address some of the points which are set out in the report, but also to respond to the some of the issues that have been raised this evening. So this this policy has had quite a long journey. It began nearly a year ago, uh, and it's worth just identifying two or three things which have changed in that period. So the first one is that the council's adopted a climate change strategy and an action plan, and also agreed the first year delivery plan and committed to being net zero as a council by 2030 and by 2050 to be a net zero carbon borough. Uh, just two months ago, uh, in a fairly historic case in the coroner's court, air pollution was listed as a case as a cause of death in the case of a, uh, a Lewisham schoolgirl, uh, Ella Kissy Deborah. Uh, and this will potentially have very significant longer term impact on the way we deal with air pollution right across London. The first step will be fairly soon that the coroner will publish a prevention of further deaths report, uh, which will identify issues that all London boroughs will need uh, to deal with. Uh, and in the last few weeks, uh, a group of cross-party politicians uh, supported by campaigners and charities uh, has proposed amendments to the Environment Bill to include air quality limits uh, that are in line with those recommended by the World Health Organization. So air pollution, carbon is, is top of the agenda nationally uh, and across London. And evidence suggests that in London, 4,000 deaths a year are caused by air pollution. A most recent study commissioned by uh, Imperial College uh, only just released showed uh, or found that in 2019 uh, over 4,000 Londoners died due to the impact of toxic air. So turning to the, the, the issues in the paper uh, and the first point to make is that the policy approach to charging more to park in the borough uh, has already been accepted. Uh, to charge more to park in the borough to deal with air quality has already been accepted. Uh, and that was adopted 
by the council over 18 months ago uh, and led to the increase in charges in January 2020. This policy proposal in front of members is one of about fairness and the adjustments being proposed to residence permits and to parking through using visitor parking permits would allow charges to go up as well as down. So many people would pay less than they're currently paying. Uh, and we're viewing this in a very binary way that this is about raising charges and raising costs for everyone. That isn't the case. It is an approach to apply the principle of polluter pays. London's air quality is improving, but much more needs to be done at a London wide level and by boroughs to continue that shift and to get the behavior change necessary to save lives. Dealing with individual points in the calling, just briefly chair, if I could. Uh, the first point, I think it would be unfair to describe the approach to this policy as lacking openness and scrutiny. As you can see on page one of the report, there have been numerous opportunities for engagement over the last year. Scrutiny and consultation, including a six week period during the autumn of last year. And indeed the recommendations and the approach has changed as a consequence of scrutiny's work uh, at sustainable communities with the recommendations to cabinet changing. Air pollution is a, is a borough wide problem. And whilst there may be certain areas of poorer air quality, it's not the case that this is an east of the borough problem. Uh, a table on, I think it's page 10 of the report, provides a map showing where air pollution exists. And you can see there that it's a borough wide problem. Um, in addition, the foundation of our policy that's been adopted already is one of recognizing the unequal availability of public transport and the charges reflect that. That policy approach isn't new, that was embedded in January last year based upon decisions over 18 months ago. The policy proposed today isn't geographically focused, it's vehicle focused. It's about the higher polluting vehicles, which are owned borough wide, not just in the west of the borough, but in the east of the borough. But we do know that ownership of vehicles in the east of the borough is lower per household. Higher and lower polluting vehicles are owned across the borough though, and that's an important point. On proportionality, the calling suggests that pricing doesn't work. And if it did, then the previous price changes would make this change unnecessary. Uh, this seems to ignore the fact that the shift to emissions-based charging was always planned, but hasn't been possible until now. We signaled this over two years ago that emissions-based charging was a proposal. It was clear in several policy documents. It's only now that the, the technology is available for us to, to introduce this. And it isn't that this policy a proposal is a, a reflection of any failure or indeed success of the previous policy. It's another planned layer and a more sophisticated way of ensuring that there are incentives and disincentives built into the system. <clears throat> As the response suggests, we're beginning to see an impact of the approach introduced a year ago uh, and the diesel levy that we uh, implemented also showed significant improvements in terms of a reduction in diesel car ownership. Some of the calling matters raised are not about the proposed new fair approach to charging, but seem more focused on the principles underpinning the approach, such as the PTEL rating, which as I say, was introduced uh, over a year ago. On human rights and equalities, uh, I think the equality analysis is, is very comprehensive and does recognize a potential negative impact on some groups with protected characteristics, but that doesn't mean that the policy is discriminatory, nor does it suggest that the council has not met its statutory public sector equality duty. It's worth noting, and this is particularly in response to points raised this evening, that the consequences of air pollution and climate change fall much more heavily on many of the population represented in the protected characteristics categories, BAME, elderly, disabilities. And those are predominantly populations you'll see in the east of the borough. So not to introduce an approach which recognizes air pollution uh, and seeks to address it is actually more adversely affecting the population that we're saying uh, needs to be protected. It's also the case that this policy is not about being able to own a car 
but it's about paying slightly more if you wish to do that, or taking the choice to shift towards a lower polluting car. Uh, and that's a choice that we would hope that people would take and to pay less as a consequence by shifting to a lower polluting car. The, in terms of the presumption in favour of openness, um, as the paper says, 1,600 responses were received, and this equates to about 0.7% of the population of the borough, uh, and just over 1% of the adult population. It's also less than 10% of the CPZ permit holders in the borough. It was a very good response uh, and reflected the openness of the consultation, but it was never billed as a referendum. 99% of the adult population of the borough didn't respond. And as we know from history and experience, uh, respondents to consultation rarely attract those who support the proposals or who are beneficiaries. And all the responses need to be set against uh, and in the context of the public health and climate change challenge that we face. Point E in the, the calling seems to again focus on the principle of charging per se, rather than the more focused polluter pays principle. And there will be a clear financial incentive to shift to lower polluting vehicles and pay less with this policy. Higher polluting vehicles, as I've said, around across the borough. Uh, I'm coming close to the end now, Chair, just two further points. Firstly, on the use of money, uh, the response sets out the lawful use of monies, but I'd like to emphasize that, that if this policy was successful, it would raise very little in the medium to long term. The financial projections that we've included are only over the term of the medium term financial strategy. If you go beyond that, uh, it would be likely to reduce uh, the revenue impact beyond that period. Uh, and many would pay less uh, and many more uh, and all motorists could pay less if they made the right choices in terms of shifting to a, a lower polluting vehicle. The calling suggests that no alternatives were considered, but I will now turn to page 42 of the report that went to Cabinet and to scrutiny. There are several alternatives that were included in that paper. Uh, and this is a busy area of policy development in London uh, and nationally, with the Mayor exploring a boundary charge and devolution of vehicle excise duty. Governments are looking at, at, at road pricing, and if they did look at road pricing or amended vehicle excise duty uh, approach, to truly reflect the harm caused and incentivize less car use and lower pollution vehicles, then this policy in front of you wouldn't be needed. Uh, until or unless that happens, uh, then this policy approach is recommended as an addition to other approaches, uh, but not uh, as an alternative to those. Uh, thanks, Chair. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, do members have questions, uh, just for clarification, to, to address to the Director? Uh, Paul. Thank you, Chris. That was very comprehensive. Um, I would like to take you to, take you to task on a, a number of the things you've said in your responses, where, where I, I, I'm not convinced by, by what you've said. On proportionality, you make the fact point that 45% of current permits are for, for new vehicle registrations. That means, of course, 55% of, of residents are, are, are being punished for past decisions. Ones where, you know, when they bought diesel cars off when they were told the, these, these were good and, and better for the environment. If, if we were being proportional, what we would say surely is that there'd be sunrise clauses that when it was a new registration, then you would have to pay according to the polluter pays principle. But not punishing people for bad, for, poor, for past decisions is not proportionate. On equalities, you make the point yourself that, that the equality assessment identified that, that elder, uh, older residents would, would um, suffer uh, quite a lot from this. Um, your words are particularly detrimental impact from the elderly. The only concession you appear to have given is to give elderly residents on their own, paying count, getting in receipt of tax benefit, one half price scratch card a month. Is that really, is that really all we can do? Because when we accept that, yes, indeed, elderly residents will indeed suffer from both a digi the, digital, the digital issue of not being on the internet or perhaps not being on the internet and secondly, needing more visitors. Surely we can do more on that as well. And lastly, on clarity of aims and desired outcomes, 
as Councillor Holden has mentioned, uh, uh, the, the Lib Dems have been arguing for a long while now that we should have a, a rebate for low car usage because that will achieve many of our outcomes. It will reduce emissions, reduce fear uh, congestion, improve road safety. Why have we have the council absolutely refused to give a discount for low mileage? It'd be very easy to bring in because you have to give in your mileage with every MOT every year. We could easily reward people for not using their cars very much. And, and that again would help those who can't afford to change. The rich can either can either buy a new car, electric car, or, or they or 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 they they can pay this. Those who are who are less well off. We need to help them achieve our aims. And again, that would be achieved by a low mileage rebate. So what I'd say to you is, why, why can we not tweak the policy in these various ways to address what we both want, which is less air pollution and more sustainable travel? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, Chris, do you want to respond on, on tweaking the possibilities? <clears throat> so dealing with each of those points in turn, in terms of the 55% of residents who retain a car, who haven't changed that car, my response to that is, is I think we've signalled the intention to introduce emissions-based charging for some time now, uh, and the council's approach to um, charging more uh, for the cost of pollution in the borough uh, has been in the atmosphere now um, for two or three years. So I think that we've um, provided sufficient warning, if you like, to those motorists that this is coming. Uh, and it's within everybody's gift to change their car at any time. There is a live and active market uh, and motorists could seek to change their vehicle if they wish to do so. And have had sufficient uh, advance notice of that. In terms of the equalities point, the equalities analysis does identify that there is potential adverse impact uh, to those who are elderly. But we're making a correlation there that those who are elderly are digitally disadvantaged or economically disadvantaged. And that isn't always the case, but there are some of that population who will be. Uh, and so there has been a concession uh, made in order to improve that position uh, as a consequence of that analysis. Clearly you could go much, much further uh, and that's uh, your view, and, and I hear that loud and clear. Um, but that's a, a, an effort in order to seek to address that, that disadvantage which we've identified. You could, as you say, um, have a rebate for low car usage, uh, and that was raised at, at the Sustainable Communities panel uh, and was considered. The administrative effort and burden in carrying such an activity out would be significant. We haven't quantified what the cost would be. Um, and uh, that might be something that this panel wish to consider, uh, but I would discourage it because I think at this point in time, with the additional activities that uh, the council is having to bear with the financial challenge that we're facing, uh, that would not be a burden that wouldn't come out, uh, wouldn't be without a significant cost in my view uh, in having to handle all of that. Thanks, Chair. Mm. Councillor Mundy. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, I just want to say first, thanks very much for your, your openness and uh, support throughout the scrutiny process um, and for uh, that of colleagues as well as Ben, particularly being open and, and bouncing ideas back. And scrutiny did discuss a lot of ideas. You just elaborated on a few of them about the practicalities too, about implementing them, given also our current uh, sort of technology. This is just not reflective on us but across the board across London one thing that I just want to pick up that I don't think has been addressed or, or at least pressed further is there isn't you know that national row pricing scheme there is no national policy in the event that that would change and we know government is exploring how would it how would these proposals how would they be impacted on that how would you see that working So the, the current recommendation, uh, which I think came from, from scrutiny, was to have this approach reviewed uh, no less than two years after its introduction. Uh, and that was at least in part to recognise that this is an area of policy development that is fairly fast moving 
both particularly within London, uh, and I know that in the deliberations that the mayor is having through TfL with government about uh, the funding for TfL, a boundary charge and devolution of vehicle excise duty is 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 being considered. Uh, and the government had a call for information only six months ago about the pricing model for vehicle excise duty and whether that was uh, appropriately focused on higher polluting vehicles. My advice to, to members would be that if government introduced a, uh, a fully effective road pricing model uh, and vehicle excise duty, which properly reflected the pollution uh, caused by vehicles, there would be no need for, for this policy because that would be much more focused and to address Councillor Kohler's point would deal with uh, the mileage that vehicles are, are travelling. We haven't got that uh, ability uh, and we wouldn't need to have this sort of approach if there was that comprehensive national approach which uh, properly reflected pollution and carbon. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I want to move on now to starting to decide where we're going with this one, but let, let me take Councillor Gretton. Thank you. Just, just a quick one for, for Chris as a director. Thank you very much, Chris. Just to, just to ask about the, the diesel levy and how that's panned out. I, know, I think you mentioned that the diesel levy had had, had a, a meaningful impact, but I think when I read the papers, calling papers um, and for tonight for this meeting, I saw a couple of references to the, the diesel um, levies impact and it, it said that the reduction, I think, in terms of vehicles in the borough as a whole, taking out parking permits, for example, had reduced year on year from 29% of vehicles down to 27%. And that didn't seem to me to be a particularly meaningful um, um, change. And then when you looked in the year, the, you know, the month for month data, I think diesel levy came in several years ago, and then September 18, I think there were 427 uh, new diesel permit registrations in the borough, and a year later, September 19, there were 421. And that's a reduction of six vehicles across the whole borough of you know, Merton, um, over, if I understood them correctly, over a single month. And I think the correct, you know, the only conclusion you can draw from that is not that the diesel levy was a success and had a meaningful impact is actually the, the conclusions of a diesel levy didn't have any impact um, in terms of discouraging residents from, from buying diesel. So I just wanted to you know, put that to you and, 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 and ask if you'd be certain about the meaningful impacts these measures are likely to have on air quality and so on. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Gray. So I'd, I'd refer you to the, the, the original paper that went to scrutiny and then on to cabinet and I've got that in front of me and it's in the uh, the documents that were included uh, within this uh, within this pack, I hope. Uh, and it's at paragraph 4.24, but I'll, I'll read you the detail. We introduced the diesel levy in 2017, in April 2017. And at that point, there were just short of five and a half, 5,600 diesel vehicles. And that went up to 5,900 the following year, 5,990. Uh, and the full impact of the diesel levy started to come to really ratchet in and it went down to 5,060. So we saw a reduction of uh, 930 vehicles, 930 diesel vehicles in one year alone. Uh, not all of that can be down to the diesel levy. Um, some of that is the national mood shifting away from petrol, or shifting away from diesel, sorry. Um, but we believe that Merton's approach to the diesel levy amplified uh, that urgency. Um, so over those three years, we did see uh, about a 12% reduction in diesel vehicles uh, owned in the borough in CPZ areas. Good. Okay. Um, I think we, I mean, we've probably heard as, as much of the evidence as we need really to, to move towards a, a decision on this. Can I ask those in favour of the... Um, Chair, can I move a, um, a reference? Uh, you may indeed, yes, of course. Okay, uh, uh, passing to everyone right now, bear with me. Okay, uh, this will be proposed by myself and seconded by Councillor Gresson, if you'd like to confirm. Yes, that's, that's straightforward. Um, yep. 
sorry to butt in chat um would it would nick would you mind just reading out for the benefit of geraldine of course oh. sorry absolutely uh, the overview and scrutiny commission has heard uh, the feedback of the call-in and is minded to refer back to the cabinet that the emission-based parking charge tax be cancelled. So that, that's clear to everyone. Can I then ask Rochelle in, in, in favour of that? Three. And against... And Geraldine? Um, against. Against. So I think that's three in favour and six against. Okay, Chair, as that is, that is the fall, and can I please propose another reference? Uh, Councillor Gretchen will second again. I'm putting it to all panels now. I'll read it out for Geraldine. The Overview and Scrutiny Commission refers back to the Cabinet that emission based parking charges be postponed until at least May 2022, pending amendments to the policy to mitigate the negative impacts on the elderly, families, and poor residents. This is clearly a softer reference, and I hope that uh, panelists can uh, support that. So, this is for postponement rather than cancelling. Um, can I ask for all those in favour? One, two, three, and against. And Geraldine? Against. Against. So I don't think the numbers have changed there. That's three, four, and six against. Now, thank you for um, at least uh, not just making it a blunt choice there, Nick. So we had Can to. Can I try a softer one, please, Peter? Hmm? Sorry? Try something a little softer. Can I try? Can I make? Yeah, a yeah you, you can. You can. <laughs> We're going to Ask them to refer back to consider the implementation of a low mileage, low use discount or rebate on the basis that it is the driving of vehicles that reduces air quality, increases carbon emissions. This would encourage less driving and would particularly mitigate the impact of higher parking costs for those on low fixed incomes who can't afford to switch to newer and more environmentally friendly vehicles. So can we at least send it back on that basis? Because surely this will achieve the aims of the policy. Councillor Kohler, I'm happy to second that. Thank you. I'm going to ask the chair of sustainable communities as to whether this is something he'd be willing to you know, take on to the, the, the agenda or the work program for consideration. But without, yeah, okay. Go on. Yeah, I was going to say, actually also refers back to, to Nick's previous one as well, in the sense that we've already got an agreement from officers and cabinet uh, to continually review the policy and suggest mitigations where, where needed. Um, and where, and we discussed the low mileage uh, discount and rebate. The challenge there is the technical uh, implementation of such a scheme. While I'm sure we would all sympathize with that, it, my concern would be supporting something which by its very nature is completely technically impossible to do at this current level of technology. We, you know, we can take it away and, and talk about it and explore how, so what's the path of technology that could be adapted? And we've already supported a motion, uh, sorry, recommendation earlier on this evening regarding the budget. And one of those from sustainable communities was actually looking at this very option about how do you use technology better and how do you do more geeky, smarter things with it? So that would be my reflection back on, on Paul's very thoughtful um, proposal. Okay, so let's, let's put that one to the, to the vote please. Um, those in favour? Three. And against? <coughs> and so I'm going to, sorry, discount your vote because it's not a, an education related matter, as you understand, I'm sure. Um, have the numbers changed here? One, two, and, uh, and and me, Peter, Geraldine. Yes, yes. Against, I'm listening yes. against. Okay. So that that falls also. Okay. Um, but I don't think it means that we're not going to keep 
looking at this area and wondering whether we can't do this, this better over time. Uh, and obviously, once we move towards um, mileage-based road charging, which will have to come, um, then it becomes, you know, the potential is there. Um, Ed, I'm going to... I'll take one comment here, and then I want to, yeah. uh, to close. Yeah, just on the subject of technology, if the scheme does go ahead, and obviously you don't want it to, um, I know that residents are finding it very difficult because they, they have a car and they want to get a permit. And they want to see how much it's going to cost them and what, you know, how many hundreds of pounds extra they may have to pay under the new arrangements. But they can't find that out until they go through the very heavy onerous sort of Ringo process, which is, you know, when at to the point of reviewing the process, it's quite good for residents, you know, a year in advance of, of reviewing the permit to actually say, okay, well, I want to put my car registration in and a model and see um, you know, if the cost of my permit and parking is going to go up in a year's time. And then they can try and plan a little bit more. I do that have a couple of years to plan it and they can't do that now. So I'd like to propose, I don't know what other members think that if, if the scheme does go ahead, uh, the cabinet that considers better use of technology. So residents don't have to wait until they renew the permit at the, the regular time, but they can maybe do it sometime in advance so they can put in the registration see what the um, environmental impact is of their car and uh, you know, have a bit more time to actually plan and, and see if they can you know, change the vehicle and take that, take that into account rather than you know, at the point of payment to the new payment. That, that would seem to make sense if the technology can support that. Well, having held the hand of some of my elderly residents through the Ringo process, which they find very difficult, I mean, frankly, that seems a very sensible suggestion. I don't know whether it would be difficult as in implementing it, but it uh, would be a good use of the, the, the technology. Um, without going, getting too formal about it, would can we support a, a reference back asking um, you know, Parking Services, Ben Stevens, to explore the, the feasibility of improving the, uh, the experience um, for, for potential buyers? Aidan, come in on this one. I just want to thank Ed for that um, constructive point and reflect also widely that, I mean, Chris and cabinet members are obviously listening, but there was, uh, Ben and colleagues talked about active communication and the, that as soon as this would be passed, so to speak, all those who currently have a permit would be communicated with to give them that advanced warning as well. So um, by its very nature, this is a, a two-pronged um, uh, uh, action writing to everyone who's got a permit explaining what the process is going to be and as you've just outlined and colleagues have nodded um, some sort of um, direction to hand hold in of, of how one would renew with Ringo or view with Ringo or, or whatever the, the actual physical process would be. It'd be great also to get Chris's reflection and Ben's maybe too on this. Yes, who wants to address that one? I, I hope to say, Ben, that yes, we'll look at finding ways of making this work. How about that? Um, yes, in simple terms, yes. We're, we're working with Ringo already. Um, and, and so, yeah, we want it to be as uh, easy a process and as understandable a process as possible uh, for the customer. Uh, so, yes, communication going out in the first instance um, and then, uh, you know, improvement of our web page even further so people can do some checks and balances and, and, and find out the information they want. Uh, we're also looking to do some stakeholder engagement over the next few months um, whilst the, uh, the Ringo system gets developed further so we can um, put in all the, you know, all, all the extra benefits uh, that the system can now, um, can now utilise. Um, so yeah, that work is going on at the moment and will continue over the next few months before any implementation later on in the year. Good, thank you. So... If I can sum up now, the whilst the, the, the call-in fails to the extent that it's not referred back to Cabinet, we have achieved something constructive in, in being able to uh, make better use of the, the, the Ringo system for potential buyers to, uh, to test you know, what, what, what the, the cost will be to them for a permit. So I thank think colleagues for that. Um, I'm going to close on that item now. The, the last item on our agenda is the work programme. We meet again in exactly a month's time when we have the, uh, I still call her the borough commander, the BCU uh, head, 
Um, and I know Paul's already submitted a number of questions, but if you do have questions for her, do please get those in within the next week or so, because we do like to allow reasonable notice um, for them to research the answers. Any other points on the work program? There being, uh, yes, Paul. Just the point I made earlier, that I really do want us to work out why we took such a hardline approach on the business rate support and the and the the formal grants, COVID grants, because I have so many businesses who can show me examples up and down the country where other councils found more flexibility within the mandatory rules. I'm not talking about the discretionary fund, I'm talking about the mandatory rules. And I think we really owe it to our businesses to find out what went wrong. I've had a long debate with Caroline, but we're not getting anywhere. I think we need to look at this. Chair, I support uh, Councillor Kohler and that, you know, speaking mm. to other Conservative leaders uh, in control. Yeah, I think it's something that we do need to have a look at quite closely. It does sound it's like it's going to need a bit of research, though, to get the comparative statistics from with other local authorities. But uh, yeah, I'm whether it's one for the Commission or for the FMTG, I'm not clear, but... Uh, okay, well, Paul, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure it gets on, onto the programme. Thank Probably you. Not for the next meeting, because I think it needs a, a good bit of work, but uh, it, it's a valid point, and I am aware of the... Uh, I was going to say the anguish of a number of businesses in the borough that have written to me and have written to you, I know. So, yeah, we... we we should try and do our best for them. Thank you. And with that, I will close the meeting and uh, thank you all very much for your, uh, your attention this evening. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.